Ég heiti Jóngeir Pétursson og var fengin hér til þess að vera fundarstjóri og ætla þó eiginlega bara að skipta yfir á ensku þannig að, þannig að við gerum þar á fyrir að fundurinn allur fara fram á ensku. E, hins vegar er það þannig ef einhverjur hafa spurningar og eftir og vilja ekki eða treysta sér ekki eða hafa ekki áhuga að, að, að spyrja á, á ensku að þá getum við að sjálfsögðu hjálpa til með að, að þýða, þýða það yfir á ensku til þess að e, fyrirleysarnir geti, geti átt að sjá hvað er verið, hverju er verið velt að fyrir sér. E, but dear guests, e, my name is Jónger Pétursson and I'm the director of the Department for, for Land and Natural Heritage at the Ministry for the Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, on the behalf of the Ministry, uh, I would like to welcome you to this uh, conference on wildlife management and its interactions with nature and society. It's uh, very much welcome that the Environmental Agency has put wildlife management on the agenda and arranged this conference to promote and advance discussions uh, in this important field. Uh, in addition to the Icelandic speakers today, uh, I would especially like to welcome the foreign experts uh, that have come here to participate in the conference and give presentations on important wildlife-related topics. Uh, it's very much welcome to see Nordic colleagues uh, presenting their policies and practice to, to draw lessons from uh, a peer. Also people involved in international cooperation uh, as wildlife management often calls upon cooperation with other countries uh, due to the fact that many wildlife species are transboundary by nature. Uh, have of course for a long time discovered the good idea that we might have discovered ourselves to leave the cold north during the winter time and head to, 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 to southern regions. You can think about it once you have the cold blizzard as we have now in northern Iceland, uh, which makes, of course, their management inherently an international uh, topic. Uh, while the management is an important topic in Iceland as it is in our neighboring countries, uh, while the management connects to many aspects of society and relates to policy objectives that often can be conflicting. Uh, we can mention a few issues here from Iceland. Uh, firstly, and perhaps the point of departure, is that we want and we are obliged to secure long-term viable populations of our wildlife species. Uh, secondly, hunting contributes greatly to the quality of life for quite many people. Thirdly, hunting has a great potential to contribute to rural development. Fourth, wildlife tourism, where wildlife is more valuable in economical terms, life than death, is a big sector in Iceland. You have perhaps already, the foreign guests, you have perhaps already been downtown and you've seen the puffin shops, which is becoming the icon for the Icelandic tourism industry. It's a big sector here and rapidly expanding. And perhaps last but not least, wildlife causes a lot of conflicts with other sectors, and then in particular agriculture. So how to strike a balance between those issues is a great challenge, and it's not a simple exercise. And it often promotes a very heated debate. I know that well from the Scandinavian countries, and that's the same we have here in Iceland. And this all calls for good adaptive policies for conservation and sustainable use of wildlife and also effective implementation of those policies and putting them into practice. And I understand the objective of this conference here today is to advance our knowledge towards this and very much look forward for the presentations and discussions that we have here today. Uh, I have been asked to chair the conference today and I would like to start by asking the pre presenters very kindly to keep in with the time limits. Uh, we have a, a schedule ahead of us where we have a coffee break and we have a relatively long open session for, for discussions uh, in the end. So if time allows, we might allow short questions directly after the talks, but otherwise we have arranged for a for a discussion session in, in, in the end of the conference. Uh, 
By that, I would, I would like to ask the first speaker here up to the podium. Uh, that's Kristin Linda Árnadóttir, who is the Director General of the Environmental Agency of Iceland. Uh, and wildlife management is one of the key roles of her, of her agency. And she will give a talk on wildlife management uh, challenges and opportunities. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jon Geir. Uh, well, I'm going to break the rule. Uh, the speaker said that we, we are going to do it all in, in, in uh, English. Well, I'm not. <laughs> but, however, I have told our dear speakers here exactly what I'm going to uh, discuss in my uh, lecture. Uh, so, after, uh, welcome in. Or, thank Jon Geir for steering us for our Ég ákvarða að hafa minn fyrirlestur á íslensku þar sem að þetta snýr auðvitað mestmegnis að okkur hér og þeirri vinnu sem við erum búin að gera í fortíðinni og hvert við erum að fara til framtíðar. Þar sem við stöndum núna er það að við viljum fara af stað með skýra langtíma stefnu varðandi veiðistjórnun. Við viljum sjá að við myndum gera aðgerðar áallun um stjórnun viltra dýrastofna og hún verði, náttúrulega fyrst og fremst, við byggjum á því mat á því þeirri stöðu sem er í dag. Við viljum vita nákvæmlega og vera viss um það hvert við viljum fara og sem sagt hvar við erum í dag og hvernig við ætlum að koma stangað sem við viljum fara. Grunnurinn að því að gera góða stefnu er auðvitað samvinna og þess vegna sagði ég bara þrýsisunum, það er bara samvinna, samvinna, samvinna. En mér finnst líka mjög mikilvægt að við horfumst að horfum á það að við erum ekkert að byrja hann einum núlpunkti. Það er ímislegt búið að gerast á síðustu árum. Við viljum bara byrja á minna á laugin okkar sem eru reyndar orðið aldrei gömul, þeir eru frá 1994 en hafa samt sem áður elst alveg ótrúlega vel. Það hefur verið farið í að sem sagt farið yfir alla löggjöfin okkar í hinni stóri og miklu skýslu um vend, velferð og veiðar, viltra fugla og viltra spendira. Ég held hún sé svona þykk sú skýsla og ég geri ráð fyrir því að öll hérna í salnum hafi lúslesið hana. Ef ekki að þá allan hana lúslesið hana áður en við förum í þessa stefnumótun, ekki satt? Við höfum farið í að gera samantekt frá samráðsfundum varandi veiðar á viltum fuglum og viltum spendirum síðan 2003. Skotvís, ég vil minna á það, þeir hafa sett sér siðareglur. Það hefur verið stofnu samráðsnefnd um sjálfbara veiðar er fyrst og fremst kemur að útlitum úr veiðukortasjóði. Náttúrfæðistofnun Íslands hefur sett sér heilstæða vöktunar áallun og með forgangströðun tegunda og tillögur að vöktun. Umhverfistofnun hefur tekið saman tölur um og sett svona á gagnvirkan hátt upp á heimasíðin okkar, þannig að þið getið farið inn og kýkt á eftir ólíkum veiði tegundum. Hver veiðin hefur verið allt frá árunni 1998 sem er mjög auðvitað þannig auðvitað við viljum við líka miðla upplýsingum. En það sem að við höfum líka farið þessa leið að búa til svona langtíma stefnumörkun með uppgeri og þá nýrri áallun varðandi refaveiðarnar. Og ástæðan fyrir því ég tek þetta aðeins upp hérna vegna þess að þetta sýnir kannski svolítið vel hugmyndafræðina, af hverju viljum við búa til svona lengri stefnumótun. Varðandi refaveiðar, ríkið hefur styrkt refaveiðar og setafélagan hafa borið ábyrð á refaveiðum, já, ég veit ekki hversu lengi, en það er allan að mjög, mjög lengi. Á ákveðnu tímabili fjall ríkið frá endurgreiðslum til setafélaga en það var síðan tekið inn aftur Og þegar þessi fjármunni fengjust aftur, það fannst okkur mjög mikilvægt að við værum mjög viss um það að þessi peningar yrði nýttir mjög vel. Þess sem var sett fram áallinn um reyfaveiða 2014 til 2016 eftir meðal annars gott samstarf við sveitafélög og bendasamtökin og aðra. Og þar var lagt til að veiði álægið væri raunum veru óbreytt. 
Hins vegar lögðum við til nýjar hugmyndir varðandi endurgreiðslu til sveitafélagana, þannig að í staði fyrir að miða bara við að eitt skott þýtti ákveðna peningaupphæð, að þá miðum við það að ábyrðin á að halda niðri reyfastjóknum og þannig koma í veg fyrir tjón. Það væri misbannandi eftir sveitafélagum, þannig að mjög stór og landi mikil sveitafélag með mjög fáum íbúum, hlutarslega væri mjög meiri kostnaðar hjá þeim, þannig að við erum að reyna vera að greiða þeim hlutarslega meira heldur en landfræðilega minni sveitafélagum með fleiri íbúa. Við lögðum mikla áherslu á það, við reyndum að komast að því hvert er hið raunverulega tjón sem að við erum að reyna að varna. Efla grennjaskjáruningu, við vildum efla samvinnu milli sveitafélaga, þannig að við lögðum til að ef að sveitafélag væri að bara veiða í kringum tíu refi á ári, þá ættu þeir að búa til sameiginlega ráallanir við sveitafélagum við hliðin á sér og að sjálfsögðu vildum við að í lokin kæmi ykkur skona nýðustu að vara þetta í stoppstærð. Við gerði síðan upp þessa áallun og það var ímislegt sem gekk vel og annað gekk ekki eins vel eins og svo oft er. Við vorum og fundum það frá sveitafélagunum að þau voru mjög glöð með þennan fyrirsjáanleika. Þeir voru með fyrirsjáanleika varðandi sinn rekstur, hversu mikla fjármunni þeir ætlið að setja í refa við þetnar þá þrjú ár fram í tíman. Menn voru sáttir við þessir sangjöfnisröka okkar um það að við værum ekki að borga sömu upphæðina fyrir hvert ref og við vorum mjög ánað með það. En við komumst eitthvað áleiðist eins og með stóttstæðamatið en ekki kannski eins langt og menn vildu. Þekkingin á tjóni hefur, já við verðum bara að segja, hún hefur bara aukist mjög mjög lítið. Við fórum að stað með að búa til eyðublöð sem að voru sett inn á við bændasamtakana þar sem við bæðum bændur um að skila inn sínu tjóni sem sagt skráða niður og við óskuðum líka eftir því að fá þessar skýslur frá sveitafélagunum. Fengum ykkur að tilkynningar varðandi æðavarp en ekki neina tilkynningar um beint annað tjón af völdum refa. Þetta er auðvitað það sem að við þurfum að skoða enn betur og síðan lögðum við líka áherslu á það að við þurftum að enn að bæta samráðið við náttúrufræðistofnun Íslands og bændasamtökin. Þetta leiði síðan til nýrrar áallun 2017 til 2019 þar sem við leggjum nýjar áherslur. Við viljum auka og bæta skráningar á tjóni. Ríkið, ef það á að vera að styrkja veiðar á ref, þá er það auðvitað vegna þess að við teljum okkur að við síðum að varna ykkur í tjóni, ekki satt? Og þá verðum að vita hvert það tjón er. Við viljum fá fleiri sameiginlegar áallinu frá sveitafélögum, þannig að við hækkuðum tölun og við segjum sveitafélögum sem er með 25 refið að minna eigi að gera áallinu saman með næsta sveitafélaga við hliðin á sér. Við viljum markvissari grenjaskráningar og aðra bætta skráninga á veiðudýrum en þetta er að við gríðalega mikilvægur upplýsingar fyrir náttúrufræðistofnun til þess að þeir geti gerst í betur greind fyrir því hverjir eru hverjir stoppstærðin. Við vildum að sveitafélagin kemur líka með svona hverjir ákveðin á herslusvæði. Á hvaða svæði teljið þið mikilvægast að vinna gegn tjóni? Þannig að þetta, þarna sjáuð þið hvernig þú býrð til áallun, þú gerir hana upp og síðan býrðu til nýja áallun. Og þannig reynur að vinna með það að þekkingið inn verði aðeins betri á morgun heldur hún verði í gær. Og líka með skýra sína á það hvert þú viljir fara. Þetta er bara varðandi eina dýrategund, eina tegund sem að við stundum með þar á. Það sem við erum að horfa á til framtíðar er það að það eru margar nýjar stórar áskoranir. Við þurfum við nú þetta fyrst og fremst að líta á hvað er gott í núvarandi kerfi og hvað þurfum við að styrkja. Og ég myndi segja það að það er margt mjög gott í okkar kerfi. Við þurfum að horfa til loftslagsbreytinga, framandi ágengar tegundir, hvernig ætlum við að bregðast við þeim, fjölgun ferðamanna, það er alveg ljóst að veiðumenn eru ekkit lengur einir upp á fjöllum á eftir ykkur, fylgi líkla rúta af kínverskum ferðamennum. Þannig að hvernig tökustu við á við þetta? Reglur innar friðlistra svæða, ef við ætlum að stækka mjög friðlist svæða á landinu, 
hvernig fer saman veiðar og friðlýsingar, tjón og hver greiðir. Og þetta eru þetta mjög stór spurning, stækkandi stofnar sem að hugsanlega hafa valdið tjóni eins og til dæmis hjá bændum. Er þetta eitthvað sem hver og einn bóndi á að bera tjónið af? Er þetta eitthvað sem að samfélagið í heilsinni á að bera tjónið af eða allir við að fara í einhverja mótvæðisaggerðir? Og þetta er eitthvað þeim bara allriðin sem við þurfum að ræða og taka ákvörðunir um. Við þurfum að öfla þekkingagrunnin og fá fleiri með okkur. Það er oft talað um svo kallað citizen science og við auðvitað þekkjum þetta ágætlega frá starfi fuglaverndar sem að hafa í áratugi í staðið fyrir öflugri vöktun og þannig lagt sitt á mörgum til sérfræðistofnana varðandi öflum gegna. Við þurfum að hugsa þetta í hugmyndafræði vistkerfis nálgunar við þurfum að huga að því að þú getur ekki einungis verið alltaf að stjórna einum dýrastofn í einu heldur þurfum við að hugsanlega að stýra fleiri dýrastofnum alþjóðlega skuldbyndingar og samvinna við erum að horfa á mörgum af þeim stóru stofnum sem við berum ábyrð á að þeir eru ekkit bara hér á Íslandi þetta eru fuglategundir sem að fara yfir mörg lönd og heimsálfur þannig að það þarf samstitt átak ef við ætlum að stýra þeim og síðan það sem við teljum að skipta alveg gríðalega miklu máli það er gegnsæi í ákvörðuna töku og þannig byggja upp traust og síðan miðla og það er upplýsingar sem við eigum eigum við þetta miðla til annara gögn í skúffum gera lítið gagn Gögn sem eru opin og aðgengileg, þau nýtast vel til framtíðar. Þannig að ég myndi segja að fyrsta skrefið í þessari vægferð, hún er í dag. Hún er í því að við erum að læra frá kollegum okkar hvernig þeir hafa sett sér slíkar áætlanir. Við þurfum síðan í framhaldinu að setja upp samráðsplan. Við þurfum að vera skýr um það hvað að hverju viljum við stefna með áhörslu á það sem við sjáum að þessi er svona mikil áhætta í og líka mjög skýra forgangsuðin þetta sem við munum ekki geta tekið allt við þurfum að einbætt okkur því sem skiptir hvað mestu máli þessi áætlun þurfum að sjálfsögðu að vera tímasett og við þurfum að vera góði því að miðla því sem við erum að gera eins og ég hef segi svo oft ef við náum ekki fólki með okkur að þá er stjórnunin eins og við erum með veiðistjórnunina ef við náum ekki veiðumönnum með okkur að í ferðalagið að þá er ansi mikla líkur á því að við náum ekki miklum árangri þannig að við þurfum að ná góðu og þéttu samstarfi og samkomulagi við þessa ólíku aðila innan þessa málaflokks Að þessum orðinstöðum vil ég bara þakka fyrir mig og vona að þið munuð fræðast vel og séu tilbúin í vinnuna framyndan. Takk fyrir. Thank you. Við ekki búum í tíman. Já, eiginlega já. Þetta við þökkum Kristín Lundu kjallaði fyrir þetta. Svo við höldum tímaáttlunni þá held ég að við kannski bara geymum umræðuna og spurningar þangað til í session og eftir. Nú veit ég ekki hvort ég á að kynna þá ennskoða íslensku Kristin. Næstur í pontu er Kristin Haukur Skarpiðinsson. The next speaker is Mr. Kristin Haukur Skarpiðinsson and he is a wildlife ecologist and the division head of zoology at the Icelandic Institute for Natural History and has a very long-term experience dealing with different topics related to wildlife management in Iceland. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will uh, try to cover some essential facts in my short talk. Um, which is uh, basically a, a summary of my last 20 talks on the same subject. There is hardly anything new in this field, but we have to reiterate and, uh, and uh, 
put the gospel, talk with, and uh, use the gospel and 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 try to get our followers to our sect, which is basically sound scientific management. Where is this? Uh, well, I think. Well, um, wildlife in Iceland is very abundant. We have uh, relatively few species, but most of them, many of them are very numerous, like, the, for instance, the puffin. We have the largest puffin uh, population in Iceland. And, of course, most of this wildlife has been exploited since uh, settlement from almost uh, more than 1,100 years. And... Uh, one could say that, uh, by and large, this exploitation was uh, sustainable because people you didn't have uh, the methods to eradicate the population as they came across later on. And we have a, f a few exceptions, like with the, the great dog. We, we probably was, were uh, utilizing our wildlife population uh, uh, in such a manner that they, we managed to use them from generation to generation. But... Uh, there are some uh, signs now which uh, have uh, which have seen in, in the development of especially seabirds, which are of course very serious. It's a global uh, trend related to uh, climate change and so on and so on. So um, of course it's sometimes difficult to uh, to distinguish between uh, the factors that are causing these uh, serious trends, but still we need to address them. And in some cases we have to put up a new management schemes or at least uh, collect data so we can uh, address and understand those problems. Um, what I would like to do today is to uh, s um, uh, go shortly through the legal frame of wildlife management in Iceland. I would like to talk about uh, some implementation uh, uh, subjects like uh, especially the eternal question about sustainable hunting and I would uh, like to address uh, management problems, especially geese, which of course uh, will be talked in detail later on in this meeting. And then I would uh, like to suggest some improvements, how we can go forth, forward and uh, and uh, learn something from all this, what we have actually learned from what we already know, actually. So the legislation is basically um, the Wildlife Act of 1994, and this Wildlife Act is uh, has largely been implemented by regulations, which uh, tell you how much, how, which species you can hunt at which times with, me, with the, the methods used and so forth and so on. And this Wildlife Act is uh, uh, based on the Bern Convention of uh, on the Convention, Conservation of European Wildlife and Natural Habitats, which we signed, uh, Iceland signed the same year as the uh, Wildlife Act was uh, passed by, by the Parliament. So uh, I would say, uh, just uh, second what uh, Christine Linda said just uh, in the previous talk, that this, 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 the act is rather modern and it's still, although it's that old and has been uh, amended several times and changed, it's still a, a good act, but it needs to be implemented soundly and scientifically. So in, in this wildlife act, all wild birds and mammals are included except for seals, dolphins, and whales. This is a very serious uh, flaw, in, in my opinion, and it has not been corrected in the 23 years since this Wildlife Act was passed. Although, uh, so, uh, so according to the, our Wildlife Act, seals and dolphins and whales are not wild animals. They're something else. And uh, as a result, there is no, uh, no management uh, ongoing uh, in regards to seals, for instance. And uh, just to take an example, the common seal, Lundseller, has uh, declined almost by almost 80% since 1980. And uh, this is uh, approximately three, three generation, which uh, would uh, label the common seal as endangered uh, according to the IUCN red list categories. And uh, the, the common seal is not offered any protection and there's no plan management plan in place. And the same goes for the gray seal, which is also in dire straits. So this is a shame. Shame on Iceland. Shame on the politicians who have 
lived with this for uh, all this time. But we can celebrate the Frederick the Seventh, the King of Denmark, who actually uh, confirmed the uh, hunting decree of 1849, because all the laws which are relevant to seals of any importance are found in this particular decree. And Frederick the Seventh was a good king. He died, unfortunately, early without any sentence in 1863. And we are still suffering from it because he was a good king. And I like, I, most of us like the time when we were under Denmark. We had good kings and they did something for us. But now we only have president and parliamentarians. <laughs> well, anyway, so how, how, do we implement, how have we implemented the Wadla Act? Um, we have basically uh, like four uh, uh, kind of a, a pedal stills for uh, it's the minister, it's the a management institute, which is the minister, uh, institute for the environment, and then we have a research institute, which is the Icelandic Institute of Natural History. So these are the three main components that are um, supposed to uh, carry on the the Wadlav Act and. Uh, uh, I would say that sometimes we have uh, difficulties in uh, communicating and also because you usually use a lot of letters in communications, it takes a long time to get simple things done. So there is, has to be, uh, in my opinion, some, um, some better uh, streamlining of, all this, of this whole process. But anyway, these, these are the three main components or the institutes which actually uh, carry on the Wildlife Act. And the system is in effect, it's a, it's a relatively good system. We have an annual hunter's license that every hunter has to apply for. And uh, that has actually has been a, I, I think the system is an envy from many of the other countries. Uh, we, there are fees are used to um, running the program. Actually a very high proportion of it is used to run the program. And then the rest is used to um, uh, monitor target species, which recently have been decided upon uh, by a scientific committee, which actually decided to have uh, geese, some seabirds, uh, uh, puffin especially, and then uh, also shags and, and cliff nesting birds, as well as ptarmigan. And the, most of the revenue goes into monitoring those specific target species. And uh, so this is actually mostly sports hunting. But then we have some substance hunting, which is basically uh, your net puffins in, during summer, that's an exemption we got when we signed the Paris Protocol on uh, bird pro protection in 1950. It was uh, supposed to be used for nations which were kind of a primitive in the north, Iceland, Greenland, Faroes, because uh, utilizing uh, these natural resources was uh, supposed to be very important for us, which is not anymore. So, but still we net puffins in the summer during breeding season, which is of course not a good thing among civilized nations, and we harvest unfledged young. We club them or, or kill them in any other mean. So this is an exemption we, we got, and, and it's still practiced, but it um, probably will be outdated soon. And then we have traditional egg and down collection, and we do not need any permission for that. And there's no registration of these, of these uh, harvesting. So this is basically what we do with our, our wildlife, or wild birds. And um, there is a very important clause in the Wildlife Act about sustainable hunting, paragraph seven. The decision to allow hunting shall depend on, on that recruitment to the population compensates for the deaths due to hunting. So it basically means uh, you cannot allow hunting if it's not sustainable. So of course, this uh, golden rule has been broken continuously since the, uh, since the act was uh, passed in 1994. And so how can we define sus sustainable hunting? There is some discussion about it, but uh, a few, uh, like two years ago, uh, uh, we did some rudimentary calculations to figure out uh, actually how our hunting uh, could be uh, categorized uh, in uh, view of this uh, special, special uh, uh, clause in the Wildlife Act. And uh, I don't want you to read this. This is basically a, a crude method that is used to substitute uh, poor data. It's uh, called bi potential biological removal. And uh, the calculations were done by Dr. Erbosnar Hansen, which is with us today. And he will be happy to discuss you 
just discuss the details with you later on. Anyway, we we uh, estimated the uh, the hunting pressure on all the 31 species of birds that are harvested in Iceland with, uh, with uh, shooting. And as you can see, there, is, uh, there are many birds who have, are calculated as being over-harvested. And I will go in detail to these different groups. Uh, the so-called pest birds, birds birds are basically hunted because they are thought or to uh, cause some damage. Most of them are, uh, the hunting pressure on most of them is extremely high. And for instance, the uh, great black-backed gull, Svartbakur, is, is, uh, is over-harvested in such a way that uh, that will lead to extinction, and we also have the data to, uh, to support that. that the population has declined by 80% in the last few decades. So this is not a good thing, because basically we do not have any information on the elite damage that these species uh, are supposed to cause, and there's an open season on four of them. And uh, in my opinion, we should... Uh, we should restrict hunting on those and, 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 and do a complete revaluation on, on those species and how, how, we are, how they are hunted or actually killed. And then we, just as an example of the, the great black of the gull, you see this uh, mid-winter mid -winter count index indices and, uh, and hunting bags, which are, of course, declining rapidly. And another example is uh, the glaucous gull, which is uh, hardly hunted for food, so you can argue that it's hunted for for, uh, for, to, to prevent damage, but the, the hunting takes place in winter when there's ha hardly any damage uh, caused by those species, and it has declined uh, in considerable amount, uh, more than uh, almost 70 percent in, in a few decades. So this is a, a, a ugly story, or ugly stories actually. That, um. Then we have some seabirds, uh, typical cliff nesting species. On the top of the list of the uh, over-hunted uh, species or, or high, pressure, high hunting pressure species actually is the uh, Brinich guillemot and um, of course it's a problem that uh, this population has in many other areas. It's not, it's not bound to Iceland and the causes of course for these declines are not necessarily hunting. This is just basically an ind indication how much hunting pressure they could probably uh, take. And uh, half of these seabirds, are, uh, which are uh, game birds, they are, they are, uh, the, the hunting pressure is very high. And uh, the puffin, as I mentioned before, is endangered. It has declined, uh, the, the, the recruitment to the population has been almost nil in the, most, of, uh, most of Iceland since uh, 1904. And then we have the wildfowl, which of course are the typical game species, most of them are uh, the hunting pressure is low, except probably for the greylock, and uh, the greylock uh, seems to be able to sustain such a high hunting pressure, although it's a very volatile situation and it could change uh, easily. So, uh, uh, a common game species like the uh, like the uh, mallard is uh, is ap appears to be stable according to our mid-winter count indices. But we do not have any other any measurements on, uh, on the power the population is doing. And then, of course, all the facts that I have mentioned here have been mentioned time and again in various reports issued by councils and uh, committees, ATA committees, uh, long-term committees. So uh, uh, the, the, green, uh, the green report, which uh, Christine Linda mentioned also, is uh, 436 pages long, of course. But it has a lot of good recommendations. One should read it at least once a year in the Christmas recess. And now I would like to touch up on uh, some uh, specific management uh, issues. It's the geese. Geese have been, of course, two species common in Iceland uh, since living memory. There are signs uh, in the center of Iceland where, actually, where they were actually harvested. They were. Uh, gathered when they were flightless into these small pens and, and killed and, and brought to the lowlands where they were consumed. And uh, today we see large numbers of geese and swans in uh, cultivated lands, which have caused a lot of uh, arguments and discussions and uh, whatever about the, how, 
how terrible they are, and of course uh, they can be. And this is a part of the largest group of grey lags that has been uh, observed in Iceland in a, in a field, about 8,000 birds. Mm-hmm. Of course, this, uh, this field has been already been harvested, and most of the birds actually use fields that, are, that, are, uh, that have been harvested. So the actual damage is not necessarily in the number of birds. But all these populations have increased dam- dramatically with one exception. Uh, if you take, just take the uh, population uh, development since the, uh, since the turn of the century, the hooper swans have increased by 60%. The grey lag have been more or less stable, have probably increased a little bit. Pinkfoot has increased extremely, uh, it's about over 100%. Uh, barnacle goose by 50%, and Brent goose by almost 40%. But the white front goose is the exemption. It has declined and is endangered. That's the Greenland subspecies uh, Flavirostris. So if we would convert those numbers into uh, Hooper swans equivalents uh, based on the, the size of the birds, the, 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 the whole suite has increased by 65%. And about uh, 56% of, this, of the biomass is actually pink-footed goose. So of course, uh, there is a, uh, the farmers can be concerned, and everybody actually is concerned about this huge increase in geese, uh, in goose populations, and we will get a lot of uh, new knowledge about that uh, later on in this uh, session. So uh, the two main culprits, in, um, or three main culprits in the cultivated areas in Iceland are hooper swan, pinkfoot goose, and grey goose. And as you see, the, the um, the uh, grey lag has not increased uh, anything uh, uh, significantly since 1990, but the others are, are rising rapidly. So uh, how do we deal with that? Well, f- before I ad- uh, address that, I will just mention that the, uh, we do have uh, very uh, important international obligations. Uh, about uh, almost 80% of the breeding pink feet in the world, they nest in Iceland. So we have obligation of, of, to preserve these uh, breeding areas and, and, uh, and uh, staging areas for this species. But of course, uh, how much, how many? This uh, graph shows the uh, development of the pink food population and uh, there's the Iceland Greenland population on the wintering grounds in, in Greenland. These are the gray dots. The, uh, the blue dots in line is uh, the development of the breeding population in Thjorsaver, which used to be the largest uh, breeding, single breeding concentration in the world, but it has now been surpassed by Guðlustungur, which is not a very far away, where we estimated there were 20,000 breeding pairs in 2010. So we know that the, the, the geese uh, grazing in Thjorsaver caused uh, significant uh, alteration of the vegetation, we do not have the similar data for Guðlustungur, but uh, this, this, of course, is very well known with other species, such as the snow goose in uh, northern Canada, where they have uh, caused, actually, serious damage to the tundra. So this might be something that we, would, uh, we have to address uh, sometime. But the, uh, the problem with the, with the grey lake, for instance, is that it's found almost everywhere in Iceland in spring. This is a count that was done in uh, the spring of 2012, and shows that they, the grey lags can be found on almost any cultivated field uh, there is. So uh, how do we deal with uh, a species that's such, so numerous and so widespread? So I, I don't think, think you deal with it at all. That's, that's the basic uh, conclusion. And then we have, of course, serious, uh, sometimes uh, serious problems with molting geese uh, grazing on, on, on uh, on hay fields in summer, but that's usually not uh, common anymore. That used to be more, more of a problem. And uh, then there's another uh, issue that has to be addressed is the, um, the behavior of the grey lags. And since about 2000, they have stayed longer in Iceland than they used to do before, which means that they are more prone to, uh, to uh, be found in, in hay fields and, and, and corn fields. Uh, than, than, than before, and also it uh, makes all the interpretation of the counting data difficult. Uh, if you look at the two uh, lines, the, uh, you can see there's a, 
there's a fall in, in the number that is found in Britain as the numbers increase in Iceland during the uh, survey period in November. So, uh, so if, uh, if this, this uh, development will continue, you, you might have a, a resident a grey lag population of considerable uh, number. So, but this is something that has to be looked into. And, uh, and it means that we have to change our survey methods also. We used to rely on the Brits to do our surveys, but now it, we have to be able to come up with uh, methods and, and uh, financial support to, to, to do them. Uh, uh, cornfields, of course, are, uh, I mean, a uh, crop, not cornfield, it's, it's not called cornfield. Um, crop, which is basically barley in Iceland, is, uh, the, it has increased very rapidly. This is a flock found in a harvested field in the south. And uh, so this is a healthy field. And this is a field that has been depredated by, probably by, by uh, hoopers swans. Usually this depredation is only found on the edges, but sometimes the whole fields are, are, uh, are damaged. Cereal crops in Iceland, it has the, uh, the harvest has increased very much since, uh, since 1990, but there have been some setbacks lately, and uh, they can mostly be explained by severe weather. It can be cold spring, cold summer, rainy fall, cold spring. And of course, whenever this happens, the farmers, they cry out that geese and swans are destroying their livelihoods. And uh, like, for instance, this year, there was a relatively good season for corn. Nobody complained about geese or swans. But last year, I mean, everybody was calling out for culling the, 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 uh, these populations. But we do not have a very good data on, on the effect of geese on, uh, on these uh, harvests. But we know that if the harvest is late, the geese will come and the swans will come and they might destroy the crop. That's the same story that can be told everywhere in the world. Late harvest means problems because the birds tend to go into the field late. So there has been some uh, investigation done through the uh, farmers uh, registry and they did this in 2014. I think it's a relatively good um, uh, scientifically uh, sound method to collect data th through a, a system that the farmers use to uh, register their crop and, and, and so, so forth and so on. This is uh, just an example from the southern lowlands. Uh, the intensity is uh, depicted by the colors. Red, of course, means severe damage and, and green a little. And uh, the, the reported crop depreda depredation uh, was in many other areas. In many areas, uh, just uh, to, and most of them were associated with the large flocks of of goose or uh, of a geese or swans, and, um, and the swan depredation was found almost throughout the area, and same with the, the grey lag. So I say this is a good method to collect the data, but it has to be reviewed. There was uh, when I looked into this data set, there were some uh, flaws because some of the, one of the farmers probably uh, fell asleep over his computer and he entered 60 times the same amount of damage, exactly the same amount of damage, and turned out to be one third of the whole damage in Iceland. And this was not corrected before I got the data set. And uh, so uh, you, there, there have to be reliable uh, people who actually uh, who will, uh, to, who will audit this, uh, this data. But I think this can be used to evaluate uh, at least the crop damage. It's uh, more difficult with the hay fields because that's more of a subject uh, to uh, you know, estimate. But anyway, we need, uh, we need a better method to estimate uh, the uh, damage caused by swans and geese in Iceland. And I find the new uh, regulations or new, actually new clause in the, there's an agreement between farmers and the government uh, Subsidies and, and as a part of it is supposed, part of the money is supposed to pay for depredation. And uh, I don't know if this will be implemented this year, but there is a, an opening to pay by the, using governmental money to pay subsidies for, for damage caused by wildlife. And that's the first time that this is, has happened in Icelandic laws since uh, 1950, when there was for a brief time similar clause in regards to sea eagles. So I think you have to be very careful when you go, when you, um, 
go down this path because you need good data and you have to be able to verify it. And, and in my opinion, that's not still uh, the case. So uh, the Arctic fox is, of course, a poster child for uh, uh, conservation in Europe, but in Iceland it is, uh, it is uh, persecuted and uh, the, the government pays a lot of money to, to kill it. And Christian Linda just touched upon it a little bit. But I would like just to uh, briefly go through my conclusions and improvements. I think we, uh, the legal protection for marine mammals is inadequate. New legislation is an, uh, has to be in accord with the Bern Convention. Institutional framework is also weak. Streamline the decision process and lines of command. Strengthen the professional and financial base. A sustainable hunting. Reduce or stop hunting of some species. Management plans for all species have to be implemented. That's one of the recommendations by the Wildlife Advisory Committee that, that was given in 2013. And I would say that the wildlife uh, damage control is in shambles. Uh, we need to evaluate the actual damage and possible mitigation efforts, and also evaluate the effect of, uh, of control measures. And that has not been done, for instance, in the case of the Arctic fox. And I think it's, uh, it's highly questionable to pay tens of millions of krona every year without knowing anything about the effect of, of this money on the alleged damage, and you don't even have, have, no, have no numeric uh, data on the damage at all. Well, thank you. Yeah, we thank uh, Christian Hauker for this extremely uh, interesting and informative talk about wildlife and wildlife management in Iceland. Uh, uh, time does not allow questions now, so we take that during the, during the discussion. Uh, so the next speaker we have uh, is uh, Mrs. Maria Hurnell Willebrand. Uh, Maria is a wildlife scientist working with wildlife management, focusing on population dynamics and large-scale management models, and she is currently the, the head of the Wildlife Analysis Unit at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, in her capacity, she also took part in developing the new wildlife management strategy for, for Sweden. And her talk is about that uh, strategy, if I understand it correctly. So please, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you. How do I start? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I am very pleased, together with Linda from the same department as me, to be invited to get the opportunity to describe how we work with the wildlife management strategy in Sweden. So, as I was introduced, I'm the head of the wildlife analysis unit at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency that works mainly with wildlife management. And I took with me Linda. She's an expert of regional and national wildlife management, especially when it comes to large predators. So what I'm gonna tell you is the story behind the strategy for Swedish wildlife management that we developed. So we took, developed an overall strategy pointing out the direction until 2020. It's quite a short time frame, and I'm gonna tell you why we only made it five years. It proposes change for wildlife management in Sweden at the national level, not only for the environmental protection agency's questions, and that's important. It explains the role that we have, the agency, as a national authority for hunting and wildlife. And it shows in detail how we should support the, cent the central or regional management authorities in Sweden. And it is a result of a commission from the government. And a commission is mandatory. That's something you have to do. So we didn't choose to do it. But first, 
a bit short about Swedish wildlife management organization. The Environmental Protection Agency is the national authority for nature conservation and environmental issues. We are the advisor of the government in these issues and we also instruct and advise the regional authorities and the public. And we are approximately 500 persons uh, and 90 of them are located in the north in Östersund. So I have my office in Östersund. The rest are in Stockholm. And my unit works as experts, mainly in wildlife management. We finance wildlife research. We also buy research and data from scientists, both within Sweden and internationally. We do reviews and synthesis of available scientific findings to be used as a base for wildlife management. And we work a lot with agreements. We have a lot of contractors. Uh, we have a lot of DNA labs and um, other centrum organizations that actually work for us with uh, teaching and evaluation of field crew for the regional management. We are also responsible for external not coordination, but cooperation with other countries. And we also have the responsibility for wildlife management communication. We also are the heads of the Mountain Safety Board in Sweden. That's a cooperation between all that's involved in mountain safety, like the police, the military, and NGOs as well as the National Snowmobile Board. Snowmobiles are a big issue in Sweden too. So we host that board. And we are responsible for the avalanche forecasting program in Sweden. That's been going on for, this is gonna be the third year. And now we have uh, six uh, areas that we do this for. But mainly what we do we are overall nationally responsible for wildlife management and international cooperation. We have the National Council for Large Carnivores, and that's a council where all that are affected by large carnivore uh, cooperate and advise us on large carnivore management. We produce regulations and guidelines for the country administration boards, and we permit research hunting activities. We approve traps and delegate the right to decide protective license hunting to the regional management, except for seals and golden eagle. That's still on us. So wildlife is extremely important in Sweden also. Game animals are important for many people's livelihood not as living on it, like earning money, but as a benefit for your health and for your life. The species that dominates are of course moose and wild boar and then large carnivore. And the last years we shoot more wild boars than moose in Sweden, so they are increasing extremely fast. We had a new national policy for large carnivore 2009, that means that all decisions about large carnivore management are moved from the central authorities, like us, to the regional authorities, closer to the people impacted by large carnivores. But we still make the national management plans for bear, lynx, wolverine, wolf, golden eagle, cormorants, and wild boar. And we are working to do this on large grazing birds as well. But still, the regional authorities has to make their own regional management plans based on our national plans. And then we have the counties, the county boards. They are independent authorities uh, that make their own decision. There are 21 and they represent the state as well as we do, but on the regional level. They have to follow the same laws, international laws, national laws and regulation as we have to. So the link between the county citizens 
and the central government, the Swedish parliament, and the state authorities. And I think I talk with those 21 countries every day. So it's a close cooperation. And the counties are organized in three large carnivore management areas. In the north, we have the reindeer husbandry and um, wolverine, lynx, and bears, and some single wolves. In the middle, we have a lot of hunters and uh, moose and deers and almost all the wolves. And in the south, we have the agriculture areas and the lynx, golden eagles, and some wolf. So there are different problems, so they work together in those bigger areas. So the country administrative boards, 21, they are the regional wildlife management delegation as part of their work. In those delegations, they are represented by NGOs and politicians, like seven, 17 members in each delegation that gives advice to the country administration board, mostly about large carnivore and moose management. And they give permits and exception, for instance, using lights and image intensifier if you have to do uh, protective hunting. They also are responsible for small game management. And I took one example here because we are in Iceland for ptarmigans. That's completely managed by the uh, country administrative boards, not by the national boards. So this is Sweden. We have uh, willow grouse and rock ptarmigan. In the north, from Jämtland, Västerbotten and Norrbotten, we have 30 permanent monitoring areas. And we use the same method as you do, distance sampling, on the same areas each year. So we have knowledge about the system. We know how many ptarmigans there are. We have goals, or the country administration boards set the goals. They do a lot of experiments together with researchers to find out if the management actually works. They have the monitoring in permanent areas with permanent transects to detect the change between year within an area. We have big statistics in each area. Approximately 98% of all the hunters report what they shoot. And then we put the knowledge back to the system and make new goals. We have an international cooperation exchanging data mainly with Finland and Norway. Olaf has been visiting one of these meetings. So that's the adaptive management on one part on the regional management level. So everything I said looks quite well organized. So why did we take all the effort and pain to make a new wildlife strategy? So we had to change because the government initiated 2012 a large political investigation about hunting and wildlife management in a new era. And this investigation was focused on the Environmental Protection Agency so that we were evaluated. And they presented the report 2013 and they proposed a new agency responsible for hunting and wildlife management because we had failed so badly. And a large majority of other agencies and hunters association and forest owners agreed that we had done a really bad job. <laughs> but the political system changed again and 2015, the new government closed the investigation. And there was a big debate in the parliament about a new agency for wildlife management or keep the bad old one. So the answer from the political level was to give us, the Environmental Protection Agency, the task to make a review of the wildlife management in Sweden that should result in an overall strategy for future wildlife management. That should include the vision, objectives, and sub-objectives for the responsibility for us. 
for wildlife predator, pred predators and hunting matters, as well as an action plan how to coordinate and guide the regional uh, authority, the country boards, because they were not pleased with our previous work. And a government commission is something that you actually have to do, and you have to report on a specific date. This was a high-risk commission, and the discussion that started was if we actually should make the effort to keep wildlife management question at the Environmental Protection Agency, or if we just should leave it to others to complete. So the EPA put together a working group and I was one of six members in that group that should solve and report this commission to the government. So we went outside and isolated ourselves and come up with a master plan how to do this, a communication plan for communication internally at the agency and externally to everybody else that was not pleased with our job. We identified risk and priority areas to start working with in the strategy. It was a very short time frame, so we discussed if we should do this alone or together with others. We had approximately four month effective time to write it. So this is a first picture of what we actually come up with. We have to do a vision and a strategy for wildlife management in Sweden. That would be the umbrella pointing out the direction for everybody else working with wildlife management. Because never before has so many been involved in manage, wildlife management as now, and never before we had have so high densities of many species in Sweden. So SEPA, that's us. FOU, that's all the researchers working with wildlife research and wildlife management research. S uh, CABS, that's the regional authorities, 21 standalone agencies. We have to work with government, entrepreneurs, selling hunting opportunities or meat, uh, NGOs, both the ones that want to protect wildlife and the hunters association that want to utilize as it as a resort, and others, the public. So we quite fast realized that this is nothing that the environmental protection so can just write down and launch and believe that it actually would work. Then we had to talk to all these guys. So we started within the agency because after all this severe critique, People were stressed and afraid of losing their jobs. So we asked all wildlife experts within the agency to write down their story. How do they work now? And how would they suggest that we should work with their expert area in the future? We interviewed everybody within the agency that worked with wildlife and asked for their opinions about what has to change in the future. We interviewed all the uh, regional authorities, we sent out a journalist that brought everything down. We had workshops internally uh, with the regular uh, intervals, and then we had hearings with everybody under the umbrella, responsible or interested in wildlife management. But if you invite people with different agendas and interests, they're going to be a fight. So we divided up all others into five categories. So one day we only talk to animal welfare organization, people that want to protect wildlife or very interested in specific species. The second day we took all the industries that actually work with forest or agriculture or um, zoos. The third day, we invited the scientists from all universities working with wildlife management. And then we took all the country administration boards on one day. And the last day, we took hunters, bow hunters, people selling meat, and so forth. And they were extremely unhappy with us. And 
three, four hours, they just told us everything that we'd been done wrong. And then we asked them, so what would you suggest that we should have done instead? And that was quite constructive in the end. But that's a risk. If you invite people very engaged in wildlife management or a specific part of wildlife management, you have to actually listen what they say and include them and their opinions in the management plan. So that was what we did, so that everybody should recognize something in the National Wildlife Management Plan. It was a really hard work internally at EPA. So there was the point of no return. We could not change after this work to continue doing what we have done before. So we actually had to just continue working through the new strategy. Otherwise, if you get the government commission, you report to the government and then you wait for them to give you instruction what to do based on your suggestions. We didn't do that this, this time. We said the same day as the delivery that this is the way that the environmental protection will work with wildlife management from this day. And we chose to present it at this political uh, week, Almedalen, where all the political parties uh, was watch watching and the NGOs. And it landed quite softly because everybody could actually recognize their wish into this master plan. That has never happened before. <laughs> so what we delivered was the report to the government, but nobody reads a large and long PDF file. So we actually made a layout version for the public, easy to read. We also had an appendix with a specific strategy how to coordinate and guide the country administration boards. And we did an impact assessment and a public report, a PPT uh, play, uh, roll up, posters, and so forth. So if I start with a vision, a wildlife management imbalance allows everyone to experience the values of wildlife. Everybody could stand behind that. And nobody was against this. So this is the vision, and that will hold for more than five years, even beyond 2020, where we have to make a new strategy. But we identified five main directions that had to change at the Environmental Protection Agency conserving how we work with wildlife management. And the first one, and maybe most important one, was to promote the sustainable use of wildlife as a valuable resource. Because the main critique against us was that we just conserved and protected species. We never talked about that as wildlife as a resource. So we just said that wildlife is a resource for people's life and livelihood. The second big change was to prevent damage and other problems caused by wildlife. And other problems is not problems that cost money, it's problems that people experience when they have, for instance, large predators close to their farm, even if they don't have any damages. It's a problem. We also have to create a very clear and predictable wildlife management so everybody actually know why we decide specific decisions and what kind of data do we base this on. We also have to buy, build wildlife management on quality assured knowledge so everybody could follow the rationale behind the decision. And the last change was that we have to increase our international cooperation, both concerning wildlife management and wildlife science, because many species cross borders independent on politics. So the first and most important and mostly painful one for us was to promote the sustainable use of wildlife as a resource. 
So everybody should have access to wildlife values. Nobody should decide if hunting is more important than looking at them or just knowing that we have wolf and be happy with that. There's no first prioritized area there. It should be multifunctionally. You could see wildlife, watch them, you could hunt them, you could eat the meat and you could use it for cultural values. We need really good information and service to hunters. They are not our enemy. They are one important part in wildlife management and they need to find information really easy. Wildlife products should be used, it should be simple to use. We should take away all unnecessary threshold to actually sell wildlife meat to schools and hospitals. It should be simple and easy. But it should be in accordance with the law and with high ethical standards, of course. So what we're actually working with is increasing the opportunity to use wildlife, making it easy, talking about wildlife as a resource, a renewable resource. And it should be simply handling meat and other products. That's not our questions, that's another agency, but we organize large workshop talking about the gold of the forest, wildlife meat. The second and maybe most heavy one to work with is to prevent damage and other problems caused by wildlife. So we have to focus on preventive measures. The first thing that you should do when you get a problem is not to kill problem animals. First you have to try other measures and then in the end maybe the killing them is the only measure that's really useful. It should be easy to assess and handle damages and we have to allocate resources for preventive work so people actually have a chance to, to do it. We have to develop method for multi-species management because a problem never comes alone. If we take uh, the ungulate population we have in Sweden now, we have never had so much moose, deer and pigs as we have today. And we have to have a clear framework for hunting and feeding because the supplemental feeding made especially the wild boar population really increase fast. So we have provided uh, instruction and guidelines for feeding wildlife. We work together with the Hunters Association that has taken it from where we stopped. And increased support to prevent damage. That's more or less more money to make people actually do it. And we will create a clear and predictable wildlife management. And the main focus we do there is it, that it should be long-term and predictable. So decisions from us or from the county board should not come as a surprise to anyone. Legislation should be modern, modern and means effective. Responsibilities, mandates and roles should be clear. And decision must be made at the right level with the right knowledge. And we have identified that the knowledge on the county board was a bit scarce, so we made a course in ad adaptive management that they actually could take for free. And wildlife management should be done in cooperation because we have to do it together. Nobody can fix the problems we have today in Sweden alone. So proposal from us is that we want to review the hunting legislation. We can't do it without a commission from the government. We haven't get, got it yet, but we hope that we will. We will continue the regionalization of decision in wildlife management. So it's made closer to the public. And we will instate a national wildlife advisory board that discuss this in a joint situation and advise us what to do. And building wildlife management on quality assured knowledge was not always the case earlier. And now we do it as long as it's possible to do. So the decisions should be based on the best available knowledge. 
each uh, T system should be modern and user friendly. It should be easy to find the information that you're looking for in our databases. And all data should be public and available if there's not a concern for species protection. So we have opened up all our database. Almost everything is open for the public so they can go in and look how many wolf do we have, what's the genetic status of the wolf and so forth. We don't open up the golden eagle data or the wolverine den data, but otherwise you can find almost everything. And now we're working with making monitoring of wildlife more transparent. Who is responsible on what level for which species? And then the fun part, that's why we're here. We want to cooperate with other countries. Because we are a member state in the European Union, we have to participate because that influences the way Sweden can manage wildlife. And we have to inform the EU about the situation in Sweden back. We should also coll collaborate with other countries in wildlife management. That should be the rule, not the exception. We have a new memorandum of understanding with Norway and Russia, and we are working hard to get one with Finland too. And we want international exchange on knowledge. We want to found international research projects on wildlife management that are of interest for Sweden too. So, that ended my talk because someone has to evaluate the evaluator, and that's Linda, <laughs> that, ex <laughs> that keeps track on what we actually do at the EPA. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that extremely interesting presentation on the reforms from Sweden. Uh, and as you say, we have, in a way, this is like a sister talk. So the next speaker is Linda Erson, uh, who is a wildlife biologist with a background in wildlife management and uh, is currently working on the, uh, is working at the wildlife analysis unit at the Swedish uh, Environmental Protection Agency uh, and is a part of the group that has the responsibility to follow up the actions of the, of the strategy that Maria just outlined. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting us here. It's really, we're really glad to be here. Yeah, I mean, Maria told us a lot about these beautiful words now. It's, you can <laughs> line, line them up. But we have to, to really fill this strategy with, with important content and important activities. Uh, so it's not just going to be this paper product. And what the government did was to send out this uh, strategy on kind of a hearing because they want to... Uh, check if, uh, uh, if this uh, strategy was according to the uh, hearings and if they uh, thought it was okay. So uh, they send it out to other authorities, all the people that have been on these hearings. And in total it was 44 organizations who answered this, uh, and it's quite many. And. Um, I mean, it was, of course, uh, some different opinions, uh, and we haven't had this okay uh, from the government yet, but in uh, the budget proposition in 2017, I mean this year, they uh, pointed out that this, this uh, is something that we should work with. Uh, yes, the 1st of July 2015, uh, after the release of this Almedal and this political week, uh, we started to work with this, and it was not <laughs> so easy, because it was not fully implemented in our agency, uh, and uh, we had to join three wildlife units uh, uh, planning together. And, this was three wildlife units that was, uh, had different uh, focus. It was our unit, at the wildlife analysis uh, unit, and we are responsible for the uh, knowledge and uh, 
to financing research. Uh, the second wildlife unit is, was responsible for guidance. Uh, and the third wildlife unit was responsible for decision and uh, permits uh, and hunting databases and so on. So we have to join all these three units together. And it was a lot of at least six directors and it's a lot of people to join within the agency. And then the Swedish EPA decided to start uh, this uh, evaluator group, uh, which uh, I am one of the of, of the officers in that group, and we have, I have three colleagues. And we have the responsible, uh, responsible to monitor this work and see that it's really uh, going according to the plan. So it's not just going to be this paper product. And we are organized directly under the, the um, directors of the Swedish EPA. And we have this meeting every three months with the leaders of the agency to follow up the implementation. We discuss and look at how many activities is according to plan, how many is postponed, and how many is requir requiring more resources. Maybe some of the activities we have to just delete because we couldn't uh, do them. And it's really important then that we communicate why we are delete them. So sometimes we have to reprioritize. Uh, I mean, ex for example, if some wildlife disease is coming, uh, we have this chronic wasting disease in Norway now, and uh, maybe uh, it may impact our ungulates as well. So we need sometimes we need to reprioritizing uh, our activities, of course. I mean, things come coming up. You know how it is in wildlife management. Uh, and with this uh, meeting, we also had to discuss key issues. And this is just an example, this uh, green and yellow and red activities. It's just an example of how, how the uh, graphics looks when we present, presentate them to the leaders. Yes, it's really important with communication and how do we communicate what we are doing. And we have this uh, customized layout, as you see in this roll-up. Uh, we have this public report, and we have it in English also, so you can have it later on, on email. I don't have it with me, fortunately. And we have this presentation, we have a poster, and we have a, a summary that we can send out to before we're going to big meetings or conference. So it's a whole communicate, communicating package. Uh, we have uh, two different digital newsletters, and this is one of them. It's about the wildlife management, and it's called uh, Built Nit Wild News. We release it four times a year, and everyone who is interested can just sign it up, and then you uh, it com comes to, to your email, so it's really easy. And this news is about uh, Swedish Capricale giving hope in Germany, because we have an exchange uh, program, so we put Capricales in Denmark. We have also this uh, briefly digital newsletter and it's aimed for other authorities and stakeholders and it's uh, it's kind of brief news uh, and it's published 10 times per year approximately uh, and it's become really popular because you I mean we have information all the time and this is really short news that you can uh, fast get on a picture of, of what's going on in Swedish wildlife management. Uh, yes, we have, of course, other meetings, activities. This is my favorite meeting, <laughs> when you just can sit and have a discussion over a cup of coffee. Uh, <laughs> maybe we don't have that time so, so, so very often, but I think it's uh, really important to just discuss eye to eye. Uh, in this uh, 
problematic issues. Uh, and we, uh, I mean, we support, we um, participate in meeting and conference, kind of like we're doing today. We have going to a lot of game fairs through whole Sweden from north to south. We have meetings uh, with the Swedish Hunter Association uh, four times uh, per year. And also we try to get uh, stakeholders to communicate their part of the strategy. We have three national uh, councils in Sweden. One for large carnivore, one for unglets and one for large uh, birds. And now we're discussing to, I mean, maybe join them or have a national uh, wildlife council instead, like in, like in Denmark. Yes, have we seen some results of this hard work? Yes, actually we have. Uh, we, we see that um, the management has gone from a more conservative uh, platform to a more applied management. And I mean, two years, it's, uh, you can think it's a long time, but it's not always. And um, at, we can see at our agency, the definition of outdoor recreation lives uh, has expanded. So now is hunting and wildlife a part of outdoor recreation? And it's a really important issue for us working with wildlife management. It hasn't been there at all earlier. Uh, our agency also points out the importance of quality assured knowledge in wildlife management in different foras. And we also see that other agencies have project uh, or financing project concerning wildlife management. The Swedish Forest Agency has uh, uh, come out with this um, a financing uh, thing with 23 million Swedish crowns and the National Food Agency has pointed out the importance of game meat uh, and the game meat should be more available in schools and uh, homes of elderly and so on. So we see uh, a change and it, we're really happy about it. Uh, here are some examples of work in progress. Uh, we had, uh, I mean, these research reports that we finance, it's really important that the management are in need of this, so it's uh, high practical relevance. Uh, and some of the examples is uh, we have the golden eagle predation on semi-domestic reindeer, because in the reindeer husbandry area, uh, they're causing a, uh, a bit of a problem between the golden eagle and the calves of the reindeer. Uh, we have also a an report about the effects on wildlife by large predators, a report on wildlife as ecosystem service. Uh, we have finished a report on, on supplement feeding of ungulates. I mean, it's a really big issue in, in whole. Uh, in the whole world. Uh, we have done sensi sensitivity analysis of harvest effects. Uh, we have done an evaluation of the responsibilities and roles in the regionalized wildlife management. We need to know how it works. And uh, we have also done a knowledge compilation on, on geese and swans. Uh, like uh, Maria told you earlier, we are really working with that our data should be available in our databases. And uh, we have just started an evaluation of the monitoring system for large carnivore. It's going to be a huge thing. We have uh, recruited um, one officer who will work with that in 18 months. Uh, so. We have also integrated models by using existing data. We are doing a review of a production model for semi-domestic reindeer. And we're looking into this, how we should 
who, who we can use cameras, uh, camera use in wildlife monitoring because in Sweden there's a lot of regulation about this, uh, how to put up cameras. But we hope that it will be easing up so, that, so maybe we can use them more in the future. Uh, we are also working uh, with another unit at the IPA with a project called CLEO. It's a circumpolar local environmental observer network, a lot of words. And it's uh, how about the uh, local, how important the local environment is uh, to uh, report climate change. And it, uh, we have uh, this app that you can uh, put in and report if you had seen something unusual. And then you can monitor the climate change on a much, much faster level. Yes, and this is the summary uh, Maria told you about. I can just repeat them. Uh, first, it's promote the sustainable use of wildlife as a valuable resource. Uh, prevent damages and other problems caused by wildlife, create a clear and predictable wildlife management, and build it on quality assured knowledge, and cooperate actively, actively with other countries as you. So, and this is was my last picture. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. Uh, now we are a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, as we perhaps knew before. So uh, what I aim to do is that if we have maybe a very short question to either Maria or, or Linda, uh, we could take that now. Well, then we aim to take the coffee a little bit earlier and then that allows us for a little bit longer time in the in the session of, of after the break. So do we have any quick question or comment to our good Swedish colleagues? Uh, yep. I'd like to ask Maria about this uh, political problem you had in 2015. What was it, uh, kind of a rural component to this or a ethnic component or a why did they decide to mistrust you so much in such a way that they decided that it's huge art? It was a problem or a mistrust on all levels, not only the rural level, the town relationship. Because they thought the main problem with us was... Can we, uh, I do maybe you just use the microphone so it communicates in the... Sorry, it was a problem on all, on all levels and mistrust from almost everyone because we, they thought that we didn't follow the time and the change in the populations of wildlife. We just continue conserving and protecting and we never talked about hunting as a possible measure of managing wildlife. So it was a the main, big problem. The main thing was just this conservative thinking. Okay, we, uh, thanks a lot for that. We have, we, we yeah, oh sorry, there's another question there. Uh, I speak loud, please. Marie, you mentioned uh, in one of the first slides uh, a snowmobile association, but no tourism. So, uh, how is the snowmobile association, uh, how do we get that? Um, they are a part of the board because we are the agency responsible for mountain safety and uh, that includes tourists in a large degree, both skiers and snowmobilers. So they, we work through them. They actually have their own communication plan. So they com do the communication for us on things that they all could agree on, all from the ones that don't like snowmobiles and the ones that really like them. So it's, it's a success, really. And we also lifted in, I mean, the ecotourism in the strategy. 
and they were one part of this uh, hearing, so they are also included. Maybe not. It's, uh, we take a more holistic approach. We don't have an opinion. We have a joint problem that we have to solve. And we have to sit down and do it together. Uh, independent, if it's uh, money involved from the forestry, that's a big issue in Sweden. And too much angulates, angulates like moose and deer that the hunters want to hunt. They have to make a compromise that's acceptable for everybody. I don't know if that was a good answer, but we can't just decide that uh, the forestry is so important for Sweden, so we have to decline the ungulate population. That's not for us to do, because we have to decide it and do the compromise together. Yep. Speak a bit more. If we had been given all the time in the world, we wouldn't have succeeded. <laughs> because we needed this uh, time frame and uh, that it was mandatory to do, because otherwise the internal fight would have been really hard to overcome. It was not an option not to do it. And now we are half, uh, the half time has passed in the strategy and it's uh, important that we also can uh, revise it. So it's, I mean, it's not written in stone. We can do some changes, uh, but it's important that we communicate it, about it, of course, but we can do some changes along the way. The hunters' contribution is really big. We have 300,000 hunters in Sweden. They are behind the trigger and doing a lot of wildlife management and protective hunting. So we need to cooperate. That's why we have these scheduled meetings with them four times a year, and we do joint communications with them. We don't always have the same opinion, but we are extremely informed about each other's policies and opinions. So I think we have a really good cooperation with the hunters. The way of ensuring the local uh, uh, interest is through the country boards because that's their responsibility. And the hunters are also participating in all these councils, the large carnivores, the ungulates, and the big grazing bird councils. And, uh, and also in this uh, wildlife management delegation mm -hmm. that each county has. Yeah, I guess it's really important because the conditions can be very different from, from region to region. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. I think it was uh, very interesting uh, talk and uh, it's a really interesting process. Uh, I'm wondering about the practical side. Well, 
No, we didn't get, we never get extra money for commissions from the government. So uh, the steering committee at the EPA decided to have one journalist, one wildlife scientist, that was me, one wildlife practitioner familiar with guns and traps and stuff, and one communicator, one project leader, and one lawyer. That's all. We have one more question before the coffee break, so please. Uh, we got some extra money motivated in the budget proposal from us. I think it's around 10 million Swedish krona. But the main thing that actually makes this possible is how we work. We changed our way of working. So everything we do at the EPA concerning wildlife management is within this strategy. We don't do anything else. So didn't cost money, but it cost a lot of effort. Oh, it's different uh, uh, pots. We are financed by the government, uh, except one thing, and that's uh, wildlife research. That money we get from the government through the hunters. And that's exclusively for wildlife science. Otherwise, the money comes from the government. But the Hunters Association in Sweden have a government-like task. So they get money back that the hunter pays for their hunter permits from the government to the Hunters Association. And then they have like tasks from the government that they have to work with, like hunting ethics, supplemental feeding, more females into hunting and stuff like that. So the hunting associates is contracted with certain tasks? Yeah, not really by us, but by the government. Uh, great, we can continue. We have more time for discussion in the afternoon. So we thank Maria and Linda for this input. Uh, then we have time for coffee. Now we are moving to the to the later part of the conference, uh, and we have ahead of us uh, two speakers that have somehow interconnected talks uh, uh, on goose management. Uh, and first, I would like to introduce uh, Mrs. Eva Meyer. Uh, that she comes from the uh, UNEP uh, African Eurasian Agreement on the Conservation of Migratory Waterbirds. It's a long name, but a short acronym, IWA, which is something that we are maybe a little bit more familiar with. Uh, Eva is a conservation biologist focusing on diverse areas of international nature and biodiversity conservation, including the protection and management of threatened birds. And as I understand, she is the coordinator of the IWA Goose uh, Management Platform. Another long word. <laughs> so please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, to everyone for inviting me and uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you a little bit more about the international framework of um, wildlife management and in particular of goose management and um, about what's been happening in the past years in Europe, specifically regarding adaptive goose management. So. As you've heard, I work for the Agreement on the Conservation of African Eurasian Waterbirds, Migratory Waterbirds. And uh, it's also called AEVA, so from now on I will be calling it only AEVA. And um, I would like to give you a little bit more of uh, background about what AEVA actually is and what we do. So basically, um, AEVA was negotiated under the provisions of the Convention of Migratory Species, which is also a UN convention, and uh, AEVA has become a daughter agreement of that larger convention focusing on migratory waterbirds. It was concluded in 1995, 
and came into force in, in November 1999. And as I mentioned, it's administered by the United Nations Environmental Programme. Uh, the Permanent Secretariat has been established in Bonn, Germany, and that's where I am also working from. So the fundamental principle of this agreement is that all the parties, all the contracting parties, and I um, wanted to highlight that Iceland is also a contracting party to AEVA, shall take a coordinated um, measures to maintain migratory species in a favorable conservation status or to restore them to such a status if they're not already there. Um, and within the agreement, um, there are also provisions regarding the sustainable use. The sustainable use of water is also recognized here and clearly defined. However, the parties should ensure that any use of migratory water birds is based on the assessment of the best available knowledge of their ecology and is sustainable for the species as well as for the ecosystems that support them. So the key words here are the migratory water birds, as I mentioned before. And what we mean with migratory water birds are all those species that are ecologically dependent on wetlands or at least during part of their annual cycle. And um, this is like a really important point that I want to make here because we are looking at a flyaway conservation approach. So Within this international framework, we want countries to collaborate with their management measures because it does not make much sense for just one country that shares a population, though, with other countries to implement measures here and completely opposite or different measures in, in the next country. But these measures are going to affect the same population across the flyway or the range. So here in this map, you can see um, in blue, the range states, which are contracting parties to the agreement. And at the moment, we have 77 contracting parties that have ratified the agreement. And out of these 77 parties, 44 are from Eurasia and 36 from Africa. And we're continuously growing, I hope. And in blue and in yellow, sorry, are the non-party range states. But some of these range states are also invited to the meetings and also attend as observers to the process. So it doesn't mean just because they're not contracting parties that they may not also implement or participate in provisions of the agreement. Um, to give you an idea about how the agreement functions and what the main bodies are, um, so the meeting of the parties, this is the decision-making body. This is where all the different countries send delegations and representatives to take decisions to um, create resolutions and, 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 and new management plans and approve the next steps in, in, in within the agreement. We have a standing committee which takes care a bit more about the administrative work and the budget issues, for example. And then a technical committee which is our scientific body where like the substantial work is actually done and developed within smaller working groups which are represented sometimes also from a wider audience like observer organizations which include sectors and NGOs from the um, hunting community or from the uh, agriculture community, conservation communities, and so on. And of course, the secretariat which administers the agreement and provides support for all these bodies. Um, in Annex 2, AEVA has listed um, the species, and in total we have 254 species under the agreement. Um, and various populations of these species as well, because we also recognize populations. And we have an action plan. And in this action plan, there are certain priority areas where the agreement works. And this is regarding species conservation, habitat conservation, management of human activities, research and monitoring, education and information, and obviously implementation as well. One of the implementation tools that the agreement has are the development of certain specific action plans and the use of and the working groups, the establishment of working groups. And um, the way that this functions is that for priority species or species of concern, you like range states to these species get together to create management or single species action plans, which include specific measures and specific tools 
to implement this plan. And along with this um, action plan, which should not just stay as a document itself, a working group is created, which depending on which working group we're talking about and which species meets either annually or every three years and also intercessionally. It keeps working and looking at how these plans are being implemented and eventually they're also revised and updated. So to move on, within the provisions of the agreement, um, there are also provisions for water bird management and we also recognize that in addition to having to um, conserve species, which is where we develop these action plans, there's also species that may um, cause damage. And uh, regarding damage control, the agreement states that parties shall cooperate with a view to identifying appropriate techniques to minimize the damage or the, to mitigate the effects of damage, in particular to crops and fisheries. But parties should also cooperate with a view to developing these single species management plans for populations which cause significant damage. And this is also in particular to crops and fisheries. So this is not just about species that are declining, but also, for example, for species that are growing and populations that are becoming overabundant as well. AEVA also has a strategic plan which is currently under revision. But within the strategic plan, there's also a target which mentions adaptive harvest management of quarry populations um, that should be required at an international level. So again, we're talking here about collaboration of all the range states. And uh, as an indicator, and that should be happening by the end of this cycle of the strategic plan, there should be an international harvest management plan in place for at least two quarry populations. And so, Following that, uh, the first European trial of such an adaptive power management plan for a species has been developed, and this is uh, the pink-footed goose, for the pink-footed goose. And um, there is this international single species management plan which was developed along with a working group which was established. And Jesper, after my talk, will give you far more information about the, all the interesting stuff that has been happening. I'm only covering the boring stuff. Um, after the pink-footed goose, we moved on to a species which has a completely different um, problem or a concern because, in fact, here we have a species that has been declining. And so a species action plan for the conservation of tiger bean goose has been developed. And this was launched in 2013, the planning, and the plan was approved by the sixth meeting of the parties, which is what I, the body that I mentioned before in November 2015. Uh, so for this species, an adaptive management program was also developed last year. And uh, it, it's quite a good success story because at our annual working group meeting this year, for the first time actually there was consensus reached amongst countries in Europe on how to reduce hunting to enable the species to recover. So these two plans and what we've learned from those plans basically gave um, room and, and the need for a more coordinated approach and a more um, collaborative way of dealing with these species which seem to have similar problems. Either they're becoming overabundant or they're causing the same issues regarding damage on agriculture, but then again you want to raise hunting opportunities and a lot, of, um, a lot of problems but also a lot of opportunities were quite similar. So the idea came up of creating a platform that would deal with all these species, but jointly and coherently and not just dispersed. Because as you know, like human goose conflicts and ecosystem impacts just continue to grow and become more and more complex to handle with. And um, there is also a, the component of the societal value of geese, for example, for bird watching, for hunting, for ecosystem services. And of course, there are also, as I mentioned before, requirements under AEVA on these listings of the species. But as I said, there is this lack of the coordinated approach, specifically regarding the management, but also regarding data collection, which is sometimes not even shared amongst countries that share the same population and that have fantastic monitoring programs going on, but there is no communication between those two countries. 
And the same thing applies to the harvest or to the derogation shooting, which is not always reported, um, even though it should be. So basically, the need to have a structured flyway scale decision-making process is actually quite high. And this platform, the European Goose Management Platform, the idea of this platform could also serve as a model which could, could then be used for other species and for other water birds and, 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 and issues with water bird harvest in general. So eventually, uh, at the sixth meeting of the parties, an EGMP mandate was given by the countries under the resolution. And this mandate requests that the Secretariat facilitates funding permitting the establishment of a European multi-species goose management platform and process to address sustainable use of goose populations and to provide a resolution of human goose conflict. It also invites interested parties, range states and every other stakeholder involved to take proactive role in this initiative, including providing the necessary resources specifically um, that is directed to the range states uh, for the maintenance and for the functioning of the platform. So the EGMP was established in 2016 under the Paris Declaration. This was a negotiation meeting which took place in, uh, in Paris. And um, here, basically, the establishment of this platform was confirmed and the modalities of the platform, how it should work, we are agreed. And so I know that the platform has a very long name and, and the concept is quite new, so it might be a bit difficult <laughs> sometime to get it all together. But basically what this platform is there for is to just provide this mechanism for a structured and coordinated and inclusive decision-making and implementation process for the sustainable management of goose populations in Europe. And with the objective, and this is underlining, every activity and every management plan that is produced uh, to maintain the species in a favorable conservation status, but ta also taking into account the concerns of relevant stakeholders which need to be addressed and can't be ignored. And of course, the legislative frameworks and regulations, and this would be, for example, the EU Birds Directive, Bern Convention, and so on, which also need to be included and underpin these plans. So for the start, for the following populations were included, or are included, the pink-footed goose walbert population. And for this, as I mentioned before, there's already a management plan in place. The tiger bean goose, there is also an action plan endorsed and in place already. And the other two species, which are becoming also species of high concern, also here in Iceland, the barnacle goose, three populations, and the grey lag goose, the northwest European population. So this map here shows you the range states to our platform, and uh, currently we have 16 range states, and we still have a few that we need to recruit. And these are all range states to either one or more or of the populations. And this is the way that the platform functions. So in the, on the top, it's the European Goose Management International Working Group. And this working group is comprised of uh, delegations from the different countries, but also re representatives of um, different uh, stakeholders. For example, NGOs and hunting uh, communities, associations, and agriculture uh, representatives. And of course, the national experts as well. And, um, Part of this group also forms these relevant, these specific task forces. And then we have the secretariat and the data center. And I'm going to get into a little bit more details about what these different uh, bodies actually do. So here in the working group, um, as I said, we've got the range state national expert observer NGOs. And it is the decision-making body. So all the, um, the plans, and all the measures are revised and decided here annually. And so it's really important to have this concept of this annual meeting because that's where we have the adaptive management actually taking place so we can revise what happened last 
in, in the past year, what did our measures actually, what was the impact of that, and how can these measures be improved for the next year? And it has also something to do with the cycle, of the ecological cycle of the species, of course. So uh, this body responds to the recommendations produced by the task forces and, of course, by the data center. Oh. Um, so these task forces haven't <laughs> yet been established, but um, we have an agriculture task force which is dealing with that issue more specifically, so you don't have to deal with within the whole context. The pink-footed and the tiger bean task force are revising the implementation of the action plans and providing new feedback on for the working group and the decisions. And then you have the secretariat and the data center, the secretariat which is based in Bonn and the data center which is based in Aarhus, Denmark. And we work very closely together. And uh, basically the secretariat coordinates the platform while the data center is, ho is coordinating everything that's, uh, that's data. So all the countries are sending their information and their data to the data center. And together with the modeling consortium, which is an expert group that meets as well probably yearly or twice a year depending, these um, biological assessment and prediction models are produced, which then inform um, the working group. <laughs> this is my favorite <laughs> diagram. <laughs> it's just to show you a little bit the workflow and um, please don't get too confused with all the arrows, but you basically can see how this working group um, that, that you have the different populations and the different countries represented in the working group that provide the information to the data center so that the data center can evaluate the information and feedback to this meeting with what measures and what specific actions need to be taken. So until next year, this, this was more or less our timeline, and we're quite good with that. We've got the pink-footed goose in its implementation phase, the tiger being goose as well, and as I mentioned before, the barnacle goose and the gray -like goose are right now in the planning process, and hopefully soon we'll have an adaptive harvest management plan as well. Um, this is the, well, we had the first workshop for the barnacle goose early this year, and that is in progress, and a few months ago, well, one month ago, God, time passes, <laughs> we had a workshop in Paris for the gray -like goose as well with relevant stakeholders and that was really useful because we could get all the feedback and all the information that we needed to continue this planning process. And uh, as I said, we're going to soon have the modeling consortium sitting down with all the data that has been provided. The task forces will be convening and preparing the information for the, our next meeting, which would take place in June. And where we're still looking for a host country, and which could potentially, if Iceland would be interested, <laughs> be Iceland, and if then I would need to know that as soon as possible, so we can start planning. Um, but the take home message from my presentation here is actually that whatever we're gonna do in species management and in conservation needs to have certain elements in it, and it has to be coordinated so actions shouldn't be, uh, they should be coordinated at various levels, local, national, and international as well. You can't just do one without the other. It has to be also inclusive, so all stakeholders need to be included in the process and involved, and their in opinions have to be included. Commitment is really, really, really important uh, here. Stakeholders need to be engaged and also provide resources, and I'm also speaking about financial resources. It has to be transparent, there needs to be trust, it needs to be clear, the process needs to be understood by everyone. It needs to be science-based, of course. Data must be robust, but it also must be shared because otherwise you would never have the real data set to work on. And finally, adaptive, so there must be a flexibility in every country's legislation, obviously under the overall framework, but to make these changes and to adapt accordingly. So thank you very much, and please do listen to all the fantastic work that Jesper will explain afterwards regarding the pink-footed goose. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, we thank uh, Eva so much for extremely interesting uh, talk on the IVA mechanism and how the goose management platform 
aims to operate, and I understand that the next speaker sort of takes the discussion directly from where she left, uh, going into the management plan in action for goose. Uh, and the speaker is uh, Professor Jesper Madsen, uh, who is a professor in wildlife ecology at Aarhus University in Denmark, and he has an immense experience working with internationally related issues that have to do with, with goose management and most likely other, other wildlife. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Presentation on the desktop. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to give you some more details about what is actually the contents of the plans that we have now started for pinkford geese and for the tiger bean geese. Um, and I'd like to start just by making an observation, and that is that we are, we are actually living in a fantastic time, aren't we? Uh, I started watching geese uh, when I was a young, young boy uh, at university, and we, we were really concerned about the conservation of geese in Europe. And through, through my career, that has actually come to a complete turning point, that we are now going from a situation where we were very concerned about the populations that uh, were so, so threatened and depleted by human activities to a situation where we regard them as super overabundant. And that has actually uh, required quite a change in my personal uh, views and mindset, and I think it also counts for a lot of you in the, in the audience that you, you actually have been through uh, quite a transformation in, in the way that you are approaching wildlife and geese in particular. Um, and I would like to start with uh, emphasizing that the work that we have conducted over the last um, seven, eight years now has only been possible because there has been the, the really the, the contribution by the range states that have been behind these plans. Uh, and it has really been a joint effort between a lot of really engaged uh, people and institutions. And I would also like to thank the, the organizers behind this meeting. I thought going to Iceland in November, whoa, what a dull experience that might be. But we've been here since Sunday, and I've, I'm going to say it has been amazing to see the, the light, the snow, and experiencing the wind and the hot tops in southern Iceland. I think we got the better part of the weather. Uh, but nevertheless, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Uh, Ava already outlined where we come from, so I don't need to, to go into that. I just want to uh, em emphasize and, and use a, a bit of your time on telling what is adaptive management about. Because m most people use this, but don't really understand what it really means. Because adaptive management is what we also call learning while you're doing. So you don't need to have the perfect information before, before you start your management planning. You build the learning and gathering of information into the implementation process. So that uh, as you go along, you really uh, improve your knowledge, you, you become better at predicting the outcome of your management action, etc. And it's not only a technical learning, it's also a social learning. So we spend a lot of time setting up the, 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 the framework in the international working group with problem framing, getting stakeholders on board, thinking very broadly about who are actually the people who are interested in this problem. And we try to get to an agreement consensus based about the objectives and the targets that we want to achieve. And this is absolutely not a trivial uh, exercise. It's something that, that may take years. In case of the pink geese, we, we talked for two years before we actually got down to the concrete agreement about the objectives and the targets. And then also, right from the start, put on the table all the potential management alternatives you have. Some of them you think about are the obvious ones. Some are maybe not really what you would like, but put it all on the table because 
you may come to a situation where the obvious easy ones don't work anymore and you need to go to something else. And having that on the table right from the start is very important because then you also get an agreement that we, we have all that suite of, of alternatives that we need to consider. Then we also invest in predictive models uh, which are developed by a technical team in order to be better able to predict the outcomes of the management actions that, that, that you choose. And it's very important here to say that the management actions that are chosen are done by the stakeholders and the, the governments. It's not the pursue of the scientists, but we are there, we are in the same arena in order to inform about the consequences at, uh, with the best available knowledge that we have at hand. Then we also, at this point, agree about the monitoring protocols and plans that we need to have in place to be able to evaluate where, uh, where we're going, how, how well it goes, etc. And it's very important to have that up front because it, it takes an investment. It costs money to ensure that we have the appropriate uh, necessary monitoring to follow up on our, on our plans. And it also is a message to the Rain states that they all need to contribute, they all need to tune their management uh, monitoring program according to the needs. And then you come to this second phase where we start implementing. We take a decision, we follow up with monitoring, we evaluate that together in the international working group based on, on the technical assessment that we do. And then the working group decides where to go next. And we have then also uh, tools at hand to tell the decision makers what are then the consequent, likely consequences of, of the choice that you do. So that is in, in short sort of the, the, the setup of that. And then, of course, you may go back and revise your objectives and the management uh, alternatives and monitoring protocols, which we call a joint social learning process. And then, of course, we may come to a situation where AEBA doesn't exist anymore or Iceland goes under or whatever, you can imagine. Um, we, need to, we need to reorganize the institution, the setup um, uh, behind this. So that's what we call a double loop revision. But the beauty of this kind of setup is that we have, we have the mechanism in place. We have the overall structure in place in order to, to cope with these uh, situations. And then what it is about is, as I said, we reduce uncertainties as we go along. Uh, from one system state to the next, and we take some actions, we evaluate the, the, the outcomes, and over time we are then maximizing the sum of the, of the outcomes. And of course we have some uncertainties about the controllability. For instance, if we use hunting as a management tool, we may not know exactly from the start how well does this actually live up to uh, the needs that we have. Can hunters actually deliver shooting more geese? And the observability by, by, the, by the, the observer observation network, can they actually observe the changes in the population size according to the management actions that we take? We also have the environmental in, uh, uh, variation, not the least the, the, the changes in weather from year to year or uh, factors affecting the breeding or the survival of the populations. And of course, then we also have a, a, a from the start, an uncertainty about the dynam dynamics of the system. Not only the, the, the biological system, the goose population, but also the uncertainty about how committed are, is, is the whole social uh, community behind this. Are you actually committed enough so that we can ensure that we can progress as we have actually decided from the start? We don't know that before we, we, we started. And, and finally, also, of course, the uncertainty uh, that we have in, with regard to land use changes, etc., uh, with climate change. So we started this. In 2010, we had the first meeting and led to the implementation in 2012 with the Pink Foot Geek case, and we started with the Svalbard population. This was a low-hanging fruit because uh, we, had a, uh, we only had four rain states and we had a, a relatively good information about the population. But it was a very good case to start with because then we didn't have to, uh, to work really hard to overcome a lot of, of, of issues with different cultures, etc. Uh, so we made really a, a fast movement forward. Uh, and just 
to, to make it clear, we have two populations of pink footed geese. You have the population of pink footed geese breeding in Iceland and East Greenland migrating down to the UK. It's a, a big population, uh, probably around half a million these days, and s continues to increase. The population that we are talking about is, is uh, the smaller one. It's uh, around 75 to 80,000 birds now, and it's continuing to increase. And it includes the rain states Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Belgium. And since we started, they've actually also turned, starting to turn up in, in Sweden and in Finland. So they have become observers to the process. And this is a development, and this is typical for, for a lot of the populations of geese that we have we, we, we are observing in, in Northwest Europe and North America. Uh, and they are responding to um, regulations in, in better protection, regu better regulation of, of hunting and reserves, etc. And um, what we saw with the pink footed geese in the 19th is that they also improved, got improved um, feeding conditions in the winter, improving their winter survival. And now we are seeing global warming effects both in the staging areas in, in Norway, but also on the breeding grounds in in Svalbard, and that's really favoring the productivity and survival of the population. So there's no doubt if we go back 50 years, many of these populations of geese were depleted due to human persecution. And, and we also have evidence to, to, to suggest that uh, it was actually due to overharvesting of the populations back uh, in, the, in the early um, part of, of the last century. Uh, but I actually want to show you a brand new uh, result that we have based on the, the sequencing of the, the, the genome of the pink footed goose. And uh, it's amazing what one individual has of information. So the genes tell you a lot of, of stories and you can actually, based on that one individual, you can reconstruct the demographic history back to um, before the, the last ice, ice age. And what you see here is that the population of pink footed geese, and I must say this is based on information and blood, uh, blood and tissue samples that I have from Denmark and Svalbard and also from Iceland, thanks to uh, the efforts of, of Arno Sigfusson. Uh, so the population was really close to extinction in, in the last ice age, but you can see it, it starts to grow again. Uh, it probably had a refuge in Iceland. That was the most likely refuge for, for, the, for the population. And then you have uh, people um, moving into northwestern Europe and you have the start of the deforestation and the cultivation of, of, of agricultural lands uh, around uh, uh, three to 4,000 years ago. And when the ice disappeared, you also had the, 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 the land lifting and you had the creation of tidal flats that provided food for, for geese in the wintertime. But what you see here, which is really notable, is that the population reaches a peak in around uh, year zero and then collapses almost to um, extinction around uh, 2,000 years ago. And we believe that has to do with human persecution. And as Christian uh, already showed, based on, 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 on the historical records from Chorsarva, uh, from Iceland, there, there was a human persecution going on in Chorsarva and in Iceland in general. And we think that goes back to uh, the, the time when the Norsemen actually came to, uh, to Iceland. And what we can see now, it's very recent that this population actually start to recover. So in the past, indigenous people, Norsemen, etc., were driving geese together in masses uh, and this comprised a, a, a food resource, and we also see that in Iceland. I think it's, it's an interesting twist to the story and to remind ourselves that we actually have had for a long, long time a, a very dramatic impact on, on these populations. Then we also have modern agriculture that have favored the conditions for birds because we have intensified grasslands um, um, uh, with nutrification of, of, of grasslands and we have introduced cereal crops and it's growing, uh, we are growing that further and further north. So it has really provided geese and, and waterfowl with a much better uh, feeding condition. And, and most recently, we are also introducing the growth of, of maize in northwestern Europe. 
And due to the relatively crude harvesting procedures, uh, a lot of food, uh, cones uh, of, 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 of maize is left in the, after harvest and uh, used by the geese. So that has become the new uh, fast food for geese in northwestern Europe. And the pink feet are extremely good at exploiting that, flying up to 50 kilometers inland in Denmark to uh, search for these fields. The growing numbers, the intensification of grassland has, left, uh, has, has led to these conflicts. And we have seen that also with the pink-footed geese, particularly in Norway, but also in the Netherlands and Belgium, because geese arrive at the time when, when grass starts to grow in Norway in springtime, and at a time when, when uh, the farmers let out their, their cattle and the sheep, and that led to really some dramatic uh, conflicts in Norway with the request by the farmers that this population needs to be controlled. And we also started to see uh, degradation of, of, of tundra uh, vegetation in Svalbard with the increasing numbers of geese. It started with very subtle little cratering by the geese. And this area that I show here is nowadays actually one big uh, destroyed tundra vegetation plot. So this is actually something that the, uh, the environmental uh, authorities in Svalbard are really concerned about. And it's due to the fact that geese on arrival go for rhizomes and roots in, uh, um, under, the, under the vegetation, and that is destroying and making these creators. Um, it's hunted in Denmark and Norway. It's protected in the Netherlands and Belgium for, for several years. So that is also some of the conditions that, that we have to deal with. In Norway, the uh, tradition for hunting geese is not that long, uh, but it's, they're really picking up on that. And in Denmark, we have had a lot of is issues around controversy around the hunting, so there's a lot of focus on the fact that we should avoid the crippling of geese, uh, and there's an action plan in Denmark in place to avoid uh, the, 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 the proportion of the population that is crippled. So why do we need an adaptive approach here? As, as, as I'm sure you, you'll, you'll agree to, we have real dynamic processes and so are the environmental and the political administrative settings. They are highly dynamic. And it con the situation constitutes a management dilemma, which calls for careful treatment and stakeholder consensus, if possible. And therefore, in a structured way, we need to be able to better predict the effects of management efficiently react to the responses by the system. And we have these uncertainties we need to learn in order to make a better, uh, a better job. And if we do this collaboratively, it will also exchange, uh, enhance the exchange of, uh, of knowledge and coordination and the possibilities to make adjustments in a concerted way. Here comes a, a bit of a, 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 an overcrowded, uh, difficult to read um, slide, but I, I really want to show you how we have derived the objectives for this International Species Management Plan for the pink geese. So overall, as Eva already said, we have to agree that we want to maintain a favorable population in a favorable conservation status while taking into account biodiversity, economic, recreational interests. And to do that, we have identified five fundamental objectives. So we want to maintain the population range and the ecological integrity of the population. We are bound to do that according to the European uh, EU Birds Directive. We want to minimize the agricultural conflicts by the plan. We want to maintain a sustainable but a stable population size. And that's new in the European context, that there was an agreement within the international working group that we want to stabilize. So the first time that we're actually talking about population management in, in waterbirds uh, water in, in Europe. And we also want, of course, to avoid the increase in the tundra vegetation degradation in Svalbard. And at the same time, we would like to allow recreational use that is not jeopardizing social acceptance of those activities. And here we think, first of all, about the hunting. Hunting must um, be done in a wise use way in order to avoid the crippling and avoid the disturbance of the geese in places where they are not causing any damage. And underneath that, we have a lot of means objectives by which we want to achieve these overall objectives. And I just want to show you how they are interconnected, but also 
that what was really new and what was really difficult to agree on was that we agreed to a population target of around 60,000 birds. And if we do that, we are actually contributing to many of these overall objectives. So if we could achieve this, we could minimize the agricultural conflicts, we could stabilize the population, we could avoid the increase to the ton de degradation. We still had an issue about the, uh, the social acceptance of hunting, but I'll show you how we got around that. So this population target is a social construct. It's a way to distill multiple objectives. Um, it re represents a lower target, which is a safety net under the population, based on the best bi biological information that we have. But it also represents an upper target in order to reduce the damage to the tundra and to agriculture. And uh, the, the Norwegian said, we want to have 40,000 birds, no more. That was their sort of first card. The, the Dutch and the Belgian said, no, we want to have more. We regard pinkfoot geese as a flagship species to our conservation efforts. We want more. But when they were then asked, how many do we then want? want? Do we want 200,000, 300,000? They said, no, 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 no. That's too much because then we have to pay compensation and there's no political will to pay more compensation. So arm bending, whiskey drinking, etc., <laughs> led to this compromise uh, about the 60,000. And it's not carved in stone. It was also agreed that we revisit this after the 10 years uh, when the plan is uh, implemented. Uh, and we then also uh, get some better substance to underpin what does this actually mean in terms of, of, of damage to the tundra and uh, agriculture. It was also agreed that it should be achieved by making the hunting more efficient in Denmark and Norway in the first instance, whereas uh, in the Netherlands and, and Belgium said we are not willing right now, politically willing to open the hunting of, of pinkfoot geese. We may come back if you can't deliver. Uh, but so it was left to the Danish and the Norwegian hunters. And you can see from the start, the hunters uh, have ample, better hunting opportunities but they also agreed to the fact that if they were able to control the population and it went down to the 60,000, of course they had to pull back and there would be less geese to shoot. They also agreed to the, uh, between the, the two countries, 70% of the harvest should go to Denmark, 30% to Norway, because that's how uh, the, the harvest was dis distributed. So that was also set out right from the start so they don't have to fight over that later on. So this is the way that we are actually working in the annual cycle. So the cycle shows you from January to December how we're working. So right now we have just performed a population count in November. We have assessed the productivity of the, of the population based on age counts. Over winter we do resizing of neck-banded birds and we catch them in spring. We look at the crippling rate uh, uh, in the population and then we make a, a, an extra count of the population just before they migrate to the breeding grounds in Svalbard in spring. And what is really important here to say is also in Denmark and Norway, we have mandatory uh, reporting of the harvest. And already in April, we can get a reliable estimate of how many birds were shot in the preceding hunting season. All that information is gathered in, in, in the course of May. And 1st of June, we can assess predict the breeding output of the population in Svalbard based on, on the, uh, the spring conditions in Svalbard. All the data is put into our models. We make an optimization that tells the uh, international working group, okay, how many geese can then be shot in the coming season? And that is reported to the countries and they can then go and adjust the, the annual harvest uh, uh, regulations accordingly. Uh, so we, we, we started by, by a process that should deliver that by 1st of August. But they said that's too late because it takes too long for us to, to set the regulations. So we are now pushing that forward. So on the 7th of June, five days after we have the last information gathered, we produce the optimization to the, to the countries. In the middle of June, we have the international working group that then make the recommendations. So it's the, the, the process is squeezed down to 14 days. 
uh, of course that's optimal and that's really efficient and those think we can we can do the same for for the other populations I already came to that so we are in a situation where we are now really balancing multiple and seemingly conflicting objectives so on one hand we need to shoot more geese fine we need to we have agreed that we want to reduce the disturbance that may be in conflict with shooting more geese if that's not uh, done efficiently and we also need to reduce the crippling and how do we go around that i don't want to go into details but the actions that we have taken in both norway and denmark have been really uh, very targeted towards the effective hunting of shooting so developing understanding of hunters behavior and motivations was, was very important were they willing to play the game as the managers we didn't know in advance it was one, one of the social uncertainties that we had so we need to map that and understand it discuss it with the hunters and they said yes we are willing and then to, to train them in effective goose shooting we did that experimentally we did that with adaptive voluntary demonstration projects in both norway and denmark and you see some of the uh, ambassadors that we have over to the uh, uh, on, on this slide and then we also had practical tailored training courses in goose shooting uh, in operation now in both Denmark and Norway and local national dissemination of the outcomes of this very important and then international ex uh, experience uh, exchange and what is very important is that all the way along we have engaged local ambassadors from our projects uh, on the ground in the field into the international working group so that they can t go back and tell what this all is about and they can bring to the table also what works in practice what doesn't work in practice that has been extremely uh, helpful to the whole process and then we are continuously uh, making awareness campaigns uh, about this so yes we can say we've done this we have actually done this we have achieved this we come from a situation where when hunters went, went out shooting for every bird that was taken down one was crippled we are now in a situation where the hunters shoot eight birds and cripple one based on the campaigns that have been running in Norway and Denmark I think that's pretty impressive okay here we are I'm finishing in a few minutes we are uh, in a situation where we had the increasing population we increased the harvest pressure in both Denmark and Norway and we started to see the decline of the population we have now had a, a couple of, of good breeding season in Svalbards and the population is increasing again uh, so there has to be an uh, uh, there has to be an intensification of the hunting again these are the two years when we introduced shooting of pinkfoot geese in Denmark in, in January and they as you can see it really had an effect on the harvest uh, of the population and the harvest impact also increased but it's still not enough we are in a pretty sensitive situation right now if you have one or two good breeding season in Svalbard in the coming years we run the risk that the population is running away from us and then we have to go back to the international uh, working group to make this uh, discussion so what what, do, what are we going to do now are the governments in the Netherlands and Belgium now willing to take part in this process or not so that's going to be a very interesting discussion and I don't need to talk about uh, uh, talk about this process with the tiger bean geese because uh, Eva already did that but I would like to emphasize uh, that since the start of this Iceland has, has actually taken part in the process and uh, Sigurdor Svensson from the ministry is actually with us today and we are very pleased that that Iceland is now really taking this international collaboration uh, seriously so I don't need to to go into the details about the tiger bean geese because uh, Eva already did that so uh, just to say that we are now here in the situation where we have also conflicting uh, objectives of recovery of the population and maintaining hunting opportunities so again this is something that needs to be controlled very effectively between the countries but it's also seen very vital to the process uh, in the countries that you we need to maintain the hunter support uh, because they are actually creating a lot of habitat conservation for geese in particularly in Finland um, so 
giving them a bit of hunting opportunity is uh, seen as, as highly valuable. And what we have seen over the last couple of years since we started this, actually, is that we see the first signs of recovery of the population, so that's really positive. So, finally, I think we have proof of concept. Adaptive management is a useful way forward to structure these management processes, but it requires the investment, it requires capacity building technically, socially, organizational, and, and it really requires a solid organization. And I think uh, the AVA concept really shows how to do it. And it's really important to get the stakeholders on board, get mutual understanding, respond, shared responsibility, because this will lead to trust building and the willingness to find joint solutions. And then it's still regarded pretty controversial about the population targets, but I think both in the case of the pink fruit geese and the tiger bean geese, it has really been beneficial to have some sort of target at which we agree to. Yeah. And also, I can't emphasize this enough, that it needs to be anchored nationally, but also locally. Otherwise, it's not going to fly. And it also requires the integrated collaboration between the authorities, the stakeholders, and the scientists in order to uh, step up the learning process. Clear communication, lines of command, really important. And we have seen flaws in this also with the pink fruit geese, uh, but it's something that we, we recurrently take up when we meet in the international uh, working group. And keeping the momentum and the focus, of course, now we are, we are still on the upgoing wave with this. I don't know how it looks in 20 years, but there really needs to be that commitment in, uh, internationally. Yep. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry for going over time. Yeah, we, we thank, uh, thank uh, Jesper very much for, for, this, for his presentation. Uh, now I think we will uh, change to the uh, to the discussion section, uh, and I would like to invite all the speakers to come up here and uh, sit down at the panel here, uh, and uh, there's all of you here uh, and uh, the idea is that we have now we have now uh, some minutes uh, to to discuss the themes and, and 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 maybe bring bring forward questions and comments that we that we would like to have so uh, yeah, how, how we, yeah you have the microphone the portable microphones yeah, we meet. Uh, exactly. Yeah, great. So, so please, the, 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 the floor is open. And Bjarni has the portable microphone. So maybe I could ask you to introduce yourselves uh, and, 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 and raise the questions to the, to, the, to the people at the panel. Please. Dear foreign guests, I have some local issues and questions, so I'm going to speak in, in Iceland. Sorry for that. Uh, I am Úland and Bíspet, and I am with spurningar to Thín uh, Kristin Linda. I am with three spurningar, which are in the first place in Reyaveiðar, in the second place in Rúfnaveiðar, and in the third place in Hrindiraveiðar. And I will have a stuttar. You uh, mentioned that you are in relation with Reyaveiðar, að það lægi ekkert fyrir um skaðan sem refur um eldur. Ég hef reyndar sjálfur, sko var um miklum tími það í setni tíð að reyna að kynna mér þetta, átt við tölv við bændur í stólum stíl, veiðimenn, sveitastjórnamenn, oddvirta, vísindamenn og mínuðustæðar einfaldlega svo að það lýggi ekkert fyrir um að Póla refurinn valdi umtalsverðu tjón á Íslandi í dag. Lamba og kynda tjón virðist ekki lýggja fyrir og auðvitað er eitthvað tjón í varpi og annað, 
en ekki teljandi og ekki neinu samræmi við þá stórfeldu ofsóknir sem að fara fram gegn pólarefnu. Það er varið hundrað miljónum í að ofsækja þess að veru á hans að sér sanna og hún hafi gert neitt af sér. Að við náttúrulega vitum það bæði að, að samkvæmt lögu 64, 1994, grein 6, að þá er refurinn varinn. Síðan kemur grein 12, að það megi að ráðherra geti leift veiðar á refnum ef að sínt sér fram á og það liggi fyrir hann sér að valda stórfeldu tjóni. Nú liggur þetta ekki fyrir og þá er mín spurning hvernig óskupunum getur að gerst að þessi stórfelda aðferð að þessari, þessum upphafilega frumbyggi landsins sé framkvæmt. Þetta var spurning rúmur eitt. Spurning rúmur tvö tengist rjúpunni að hún er náttúrulega fríðuð samkvæmt sömu lögum og sömu lagagrein 64, 1994, grein 6. Samkvæmt grein 7 má hér veita heimild til að veiða rjúpunna og önnur dýr sem eru fríðuð en þó innan þeirra marka að ekki sé veitt meira en nefur viðkomu stopsins. Nú er það svo samkvæmt um göfnum sem ég hef komist yfir að fljótlega eftir að laugin voru sett 1994, 96, 97 fyrir stopnin hafa verið minnst 300 dýr fuglar vor stopnin. Engu að síður er það svo að þessi stopn er komin í 100.000 í fyrra Þannig að það er búið að, að, að fækka honum um tvo þriðju á þeim tíma sem liðin er. Og þetta náttúrulega þær brýtu lögin, grein sjö, í lögunum sem ég var að tala um. Mér er bara, sko, ég átta mig ekki á því hvernig þetta getur gerst í rétta ríki að lögi séu þær brotin svona á stjórnvöldum sjálfum. Nú, þriðja spurningin er varðar hreindir að veiðar. Hreindir að veiðar, hreindirinn eru líka friðu samkvæmt sömu sem laga ákvæðum samkvæmt grein 14 má veiða þau ef ástæða þyki til eins og það er orðað ef ástæða þyki til ég hef talað við ýmsa menn sem að tengjast málinu meðan anna meðan anna skarpinn Þórisson margoft og fleiri og það er auðvitað að tala um einhver ástæðu en ég hef ekki fengið skjalfesta sé nein ástæða til þess að veiða rendirinn þetta er 6000 dýra stofn hann er ekki nema litlum hluta landinu Landið er stórt, það eru 600.000 fjár sem að, að er á beit og hálendi landsins og sumrin, 100.000 fleiri dýr, þessi dýr ég að svipaða plöntur, að liggur eitthvað fyrir um það, einhver ástæða samkvæmt lögunum, til þess að, að hérna veiða rendir. En síðan kem ég í, í lokin og það tengist líka rendirum, að spurningunni um lög eh, 55.2013, það er eins og við vitum lög um dýra velferð, að enginn hefur minnst á þau hér ennþá og í rauninni þegar ég tala við fólk ráðamenn og aðra hér stofnanir virðist það vera að þessi lög hafi harla lítu komist inn í myndina, inn í framkvæmdin ennþá. Þetta er samt mjög þýðingamikið lög og það verið gildur í næstu í fjögur ár. Að, að, hérna, að samkvæmt þessum lögum, greið númer 15, ég skildi því, ég er að ljúka þessi eins og skilur. Já, já, það, það er aðtjóð og send sem að verður að koma til þess að spurningi geti komið. En spurningin er þessi að samkvæmt grein 15 í þessum lögum að þá hérna er bannað að skilja dýr eftir bjargarlaus ástandi. Og nú gerist það að hreindir að kýrur og veitar með frá 1. ágúst með hann að kálfarnir eru ekki nema fekja mána gamlir. Stenst þetta að mati að hínu mati Kristin Linda? Þetta eru spurningar þar. Takk fyrir þetta. Við skulum safna saman okkur spurningum. Það var höndarna fyrir aftan. Ja, þeng þú. Some questions to Jesper. My name is David. I'm from the Hunting Association. Uh, the future plans for the adaptive harvest management. Uh, are you going to extend this to many other populations? or the geese or the ducks than you have already mentioned and also um, yeah the barnacle goose what is the timeline of the of the barnacle goose management and also what's interesting about the barnacle uh, barnacle goose is that uh, it's actually taken up in annex 2 
in the birth directive. So it's not huntable, actually. So uh, what's, uh, how, how, is the, how is the management plan for that, and how are you going to solve that? Question that maybe I can add to the I can add to the portfolio uh, that might be either you Eva or or or, or, or Jesper uh, that relates to the to the international status of those what did you call it the international management plans for 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 goose what are the obligations of the member states is this a legally binding uh, instrument or or is this a voluntary sort of approach we, uh, that doesn't relate to birds, but Iceland is engaged into huge conflict with neighboring countries when it comes to the fish species. I can just mention the mackerel. And uh, it has been complicated to negotiate when the, uh, when, 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 when the countries have different interests. So my question relates a little bit to the legal status of those plans. Thank you. Já, ég ætli taki ekki bara svarið í fyrstu spurningunni á íslensku. Eh, varðandi refinn, þá er það rétt að uh, eftir að við fórum yfir uh, niðurstöðu fyrstu áætlunarinnar, þriggja ára áætlunarinnar, að þá fannst okkur við ekki vera að koma með nægilega góð gögn varðandi tjónið. Og þess vegna er, er það auðvitað uh, ein af áherslu uh, atriðanum sem að við viljum skoða í næsta áætlun er nákvæmlega það hvert er hið raunverulega tjón þannig að við getum veitt uh, betri ráðgjöf til stjórnvalda varðandi uh, veiðar á refi. Vegna þess að í gegnum tíðina að þá hafa menn talað um þetta að þetta byggðist á uh, tjónshugmyndafræðinni en þá verðum við að sína fram að það með einhverjum svona vísindilegum uh, rökum hvert það tjón er. Þetta er vinnan framöndan en við erum líka að vita að horfast í augu við það að, að reyfaveiðar að hafa stundar hér á Íslandi í, í ansi uh, langan tíma en, en okkar sín er, er mjög einföld. Við viljum uh, fá betri gögn til þess að byggja á og geta veitt stjórnvöldum uh, betri upplýsingar. Vegna þess að við erum líka að tala um það að þetta eru ansi mikið af fjármennum sem að uh, fara í þessa veiðar þannig að við þurfum að sína fram á það að þetta sé skinsamleg nýting á fjármennum. Eh, varðandi rjúpuna og viðkomu stopsins að þá er ég nú svo heppin að vera hérna með mann við hliðina mér sem er mun eh, betri að, að svara þessum spurningum en að sjálfsögðu eh, vitum við það að stopninni er ekki eins stór eins og hann hefur eh, verið en mér finnst þetta líka hafa komið ágætlega fram hérna hjá öðrum eh, fyrirlesurum að þú ertu við þetta að eh, stjórna stopstarfum og þú ert að leifa veiðar þegar að þó að stofnin sé eitthvað að fara niður en þú verður þá líka að takmarka þér og þess vegna er svo mikilvægt að vera í góðu samstarfi við veiðimenn og það verður náttúrulega að segjast eins og er að sá tími sem að rjúpnaveiðar eru leifðar er þetta mun skemmri heldur en hann var þegar að rjúpnastofnin var á sínum hátindi. Varandi hreindra veiðarnar og að skjóta kýrnar á þessu tímabili Við höfum verið að uh, sett, við fórum í ákveðna rannsóknavinnu og við höfum svarað því að hérna, við vorum kærð fyrir þetta uh, meðal annars á grundvalli laga um dýra velferð og okkar nýðustað er svo og það er byggt á gögnum sem við höfum fengið frá uh, náttúrustofu Austurlands uh, sem sýnir fram á það að uh, þessi, þetta ungviði sem að missa uh, sína mæður að það sem sagt það virðist ekki hafa mikil áhrif á viðkomi þeirra dýra til framtíðar. E, en að sjálfsögðu erum við alltaf að skoða nýrri upplýsingar og við höfum líka e, lagt það til að við munum e, rannsaka þetta málitni betur. En þetta er eins og maður segir, við erum með, byggjum á þeim upplýsingum sem við höfum í dag en síðan að sjálfsögðu nú þurfum við sífælt meiri og betri upplýsingar. Þannig að við höfum, við höfum fundastjóri ræður öllu, ekki ég. Það 
Þetta er, já, ég get nú ekki alveg kannski vísað svo langt til baka en þessi umræður hefur komin. Við sendum inn slíka tillögu að með minni til ráðanetisins á ákvæðnum tímapunkti en höfum við síðan skoða málið aftur. En þetta er auðvitað eitt af því sem við mun, höfum verið að skoða og munum halda fram að skoða. Takk. Já, yeah, I, I would like to add a little bit to this in regards to the tarmacan, whether the, it was actually... Uh, you were, Iceland was breaking the law by uh, allowing uh, hunting of, of tarmacan because the, because the population is decreasing. Uh, of course, this is a very hot debate, and the tarmacan was protected for two years because many of us, including me, thought that the, the uh, hunting was, uh, should be reduced, and it has been reduced considerably. And uh, I think, uh, but there is still some unexplained deaths that are associated with hunting of. of but we cannot actually pinpoint the exact reason for it. But uh, as I told, as I said in my lecture before, uh, there, I'm there, there's, Iceland is definitely breaking the, the act, uh, Act uh, in paragraph seven in regards to other species. It's definitely unsubstantiated hunting in, in some of the species I mentioned. So, 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 so that's probably a better example than the Tamikan. And then just a, s a small addition, because uh, David asked about the Annex two in, in the Bern Convention. Uh, Iceland made exemptions for the for the for the barnacle geese, and, and same with the seals. So um, when you join these uh, international agreements, you can make exceptions. But uh, um, it's uh, sarcastic that both the barnacle uh, geese and also the Hooper's one are on this annex, and both of them are. Uh, yeah, and I was not actually referring to Iceland. I was referring to the management of barnacle geese in, in Europe. Okay, okay, and then I just give uh, uh, Peter Madsen. Yeah, okay. Um, with regard to which species are going to be included onto the platform, that was your first question. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually up to the range states to decide. We, we said from the start we would not start with the whole broad suite of species because it's simply too much. So we have to go step by step and, and we, we have quite a mouthful right now, I'd say. So it'll take a couple of years before we are I, I guess planning to start with new species, but it's up to the meeting of the parties and the rain states to, uh, to to express this. But then it's also required that there's a champion, a country that stands behind these plans uh, in order to um, make the the basic collation of the information and, and host the meetings, etc. Uh, with regard to the barnacle geese, they are on. Annex 1 in the birds directive, EU birds directive, which means that you are not, uh, within the EU, you, you are not allowed to hunt the barnacle goose. You can, you can uh, shoot it uh, or call it by derogation, um, but you need to be able to provide documentation that you have a serious problem, a serious damage, um, and that you have tried other means to scare the birds away before you can get a, a license to, to shoot. Um, that has been interpreted in different ways in, in the EU between the countries. Some have taken a more liberal course, others have taken a more restrictive course. And one of the, I think, objectives of the plan is going to be sort of trying to, to harmonize the way that, that uh, derogation is dealt with. And then the EU has also signaled that they want to um, um, attempt a, a more flexible implementation of the birth directive um, in light of the fitness check that has just been uh, carried out. But we still need to have some clarifications from the Commission um, what this actually includes. So that's where we are right now. With the legal questions, I hand over to Eva. Okay, so um, basically um, regarding the legal question, the agreement is legally binding. However, the, in, the plans, the action and management plans are not legally binding. But what becomes legally binding is the measures from the plans that get integrated into the national legislation. And that's where they become legally binding. So. 
I don't know if this answers your question, but obviously all of this is going to be within the legal frameworks, but um, yeah, the activities in the plan will not be something legally binding unless the countries actually adopt it. But they are required to develop these plans and to do something about the species. So it's a bit of a gray area, yeah. <laughs> More quick. Yes, hello, my name is Elva Loon and I'm from the Hunters Association. I would like to thank you all for a very interesting presentation to start with. Like you said that we are living here in a, and we are experiencing a very different and strange times here in Iceland. The global warming is definitely, we are facing it. We are seeing the high Arctic species such as the Tartmichan, probably with uh, lower stock numbers than we have counted before. On the other hand, we have the geese, very growing uh, in, in, in the highlands. Uh, definitely the hunters are experiencing, experiencing uh, geese wherever you go above the 250 meters in height. Uh, but uh, I have uh, uh, two questions. Uh, number one, uh, how much of a role will hunting uh, while practicing the adaptive harvest management play in the new EVA management plans? And number two, uh, what is the timeline for the Barnacle Goose Management Plan? Thank you. And there was another question. Wasn't, yeah, there's another, another question there. Yes, my name is Arton Sefusson, and uh, I would like to thank the speaker for, for the talks. Uh, and, uh, I was very impressed to see this uh, uh, adaptive management plan for the pink-footed goose, and it will be interesting to follow its progress. But uh, I was wondering with, uh, with the increased hunting pressure of the pink-footed goose, like we see with the very high hunting pressure on the grey leg goose in Iceland, they seem to respond by increasing their, their productivity. So they are a much higher productivity than, they, than, than the pink-footed goose here, which is uh, sustaining a much lower hunting pressure. And uh, have you seen anything like that happening in with, with increased hunting pressure in the, in the pink-footed goose? And also, seeing that the Belgians and the, and the Dutch are not taking part in the hunting, is there any shift in the pink-footed goose in the wintering areas to, towards the protected areas? Or, uh, that's, that's something that might happen in, in the long run. So, regarding the barnacle goose, um, hunting will, will obviously is, is a large part of the, um, of the management plans and yes, we will, well, those plans do rely on hunting to regulate the populations eventually. But we also uh, acknowledge that it can't be just put into the hands of hunters to regulate the populations because in, with some species it's actually, it's going to be impossible, specifically in some countries. So we are trying to find also different solutions of how this problem can be, can be solved between the countries. And the timeline for the barnacle goose, at the moment, we had this workshop in Paris where we collected, uh, well, the first workshop we had early in June, and then we had a grey leg workshop in Paris, but with the similar, almost the same stakeholders. And most of the concerns, such as the status on the EU birds directive, were raised there and what the framework would be that we will start, like, that will be developed to work with the barnacle goose was raised and discussed at this workshop. And we're going to have like a follow up of that to really revise a little bit how we're doing our management plans. So uh, only after that we can have like a clear timeline for the barnacle goose. But this workshop will be um, early next year. And then from there on we will see how we continue. With regard to the pink-footed geese, what we witness in the population of pink-footed geese from the Svalbard population is that there is no signs of density dependence in the population, which means there seems to be nothing limiting the population at the moment. The productivity keeps the high level despite the population growth. So 
it, 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 it's a sign that the carrying capacity on the breeding grounds or the pre-nesting grounds hasn't been reached. On the contrary, we have signs of actually global warming in Svalbard and the area uh, available for, for breeding in Svalbard has more than doubled within 10 years due to the global warming. With regard to the um, um, d uh, redistribution of the geese due to the increased harvest in Denmark and Norway, we have actually achieved completely the opposite. Due to the organization of shooting in Norway, where they don't go out every day, shoot over all the areas, they shoot concentrated in larger areas and only go out two times per week or so. And that keeps the geese back in North Trondelag in Norway until the snow comes. So even now, they are still staying up there because there's plenty of food. Um, and in Denmark, likewise, this is more of an uh, accident that we have got so much maize in Denmark now. So the geese stay throughout the winter. Before, they were flying down to the Netherlands and Belgium to the safe havens, but now they stay in Denmark and get shot. Thank you. So, so you're saying that um, overgrazing in Svalbard is not limiting the, the, the population. That's uh, really interesting because uh, we are getting uh, very worried here, we hunters, about, uh, about the highlands because we are seeing signs of overgrazing when we go up in the summers. Yeah, let me answer that immediately. Um, so far, it doesn't seem to be a limitation to the pinkfoot geese. We see really dramatic changes in the tundra vegetation in some of the areas where we have the high numbers, pre-nesting and during nesting. But uh, as global warming is sort of opening more of the landscape, it's, it's what it seems to be the limiting factor in the past was the number of available, or the area of available nest sites where they can start nesting. As soon as they, they arrive, they start egg laying, and that was limiting them in the past. It's not limiting them anymore. But you may be right, in the longer term, this uh, uh, effect of the tundra changes may actually kick in as a, as a potential uh, limitation. But we are not there yet, yet. not at all. Yeah, I, I can fully understand it, and, and I fully agree with, with Kristen that that's something that we really should pay attention to. When we started our studies back in 2003, we had Canadians coming over telling us, be careful, because what we have seen with snow geese it takes off really rapidly, and, um, and, and we, we, we couldn't find the science in the first couple of years, but then suddenly we saw it, and it started all over the place. And then within the 15 years that I've been working in Svalbard now, we have seen really big changes. Yes, uh, I have a different question or aspect, or maybe, uh, yeah. Uh, I want to direct a uh, question to both uh, Christine Linda and Maria, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it was really interesting to, uh, to uh, listen to the reconstruction. Yeah, you were describing the reconstruction on uh, more, a new strategy plan for the wildlife management in Sweden. And uh, I don't know uh, if Christine Linda has, uh, if you have any take-home messages for us in Iceland, and I'm asking also Kristin Linda if there is, uh, uh, if people are actually thinking of, of reconstructing our wildlife management strategies and plans, because uh, as Kristin mentioned, uh, the wildlife law is getting old and it is not perfect, though it's, it's quite good. Uh, some species are actually lacking within it, he was mentioning the seals. And also, um, he was also showing us striking uh, numbers of over-harvesting species which are still hunted. And um, yeah, I, I address one question to Christine Linda, has then this been uh, considered? And uh, to Maria, what messages and uh, uh, consultancy can you give us in Iceland? Should I start? Yeah, maybe you can just take, take, take this now immediately. Who wants to start? Yeah, Maria. Yeah, I can start. 
Well, it's difficult to say because the situation in Sweden was so infected. So it might be easier starting from a more calm situation than we did. But what's important is to realize that climate change, growing population, invasive species is a challenge that you have to solve together and, and actually listen to each other and be willing to compromise because then the joint effort of all involved in wildlife management be, will be a success. So don't waste time at telling each other what things you've done wrong in the past. Try to be constructive and suggest future ways to manage wildlife. Yes. Uh, well, we have decided that we need uh, a more sort of like holistic uh, strategy for managing uh, wildlife. Uh, so that decision has been taken. I just showed you what we did uh, concerning the Arctic fox, and, and we need to put this over the whole arena, both to take into account these loopholes that we have today. There are some species that we want to include that are not included in the laws, uh, and uh, we have signs of uh, over, uh, well, over use of stocks and other stocks that are getting bigger and bigger and uh, there is pressure to start hunting them. But that is also a question that we need to discuss very openly. If you look at uh, how we've been discussing this, they are shooting uh, the geese in Norway and Denmark but in Belgium and Netherlands, they don't want to do it because, not because of science. It is because of values in the society. And that is something that we have to also include when we are doing these management plans. There is, of course, uh, we need a sound scientific base, but there is also something called values that we have to include in our strategy. Uh, what we uh, need, in my opinion, is uh, having a very forward-looking uh, momentum because in the past we maybe sometimes been discussing the same thing over and over and over again uh, and not then looking at the big picture. And I think that uh, aiming at a new strategy gives us the opportunity to put us a little bit higher getting out of the, uh, the trenches that we have been uh, in some areas today and go a little bit higher up there and seeing what is the main things that we think is important. So uh, I think this could be a very good stepping stone uh, towards better managing what we have today, but also being better uh, prepared for the future. New challenges, that challenge that, that maybe we are not even imagining today. Thank you. Uh, there are three. I have seen three hands. Uh, so I think that's oh, two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. My name is Einar and I'm a hunter. Uh, I think I have a question for Christian probably because he comes from Nautru Fyrastopnum and whose duty is to be advisor to Christian. And since the fox came up earlier, now the number of foxes have multiplied in Iceland for the last 30 years two, three, well, three, four or five times, depending on which data you're using. So if we want to keep everything, you know, kind of stable, then we are supposed to hunt more of those who are increasing and less of those who are decreasing, right? So will it be your advice to Christine to hunt more foxes? Uh, we can take also next question. Yes, hello. My name is Johan. I come from the Hortenverder area, southeast of Iceland. I was to, want to ask uh, Linda and Maria two questions. First, what is the role of no, local knowledge as a, as a versus maybe like traditional science? What is the, the role of like heritage and such things in your management plan? And also, how do you how are, you, how are you ensure that you, you reach out to the local and rural communities? Because from my experience, that can be a little bit hard 
but how can you be sure that you reach out and can maybe give us some sample that we can use here in Iceland? Yes, Einar, my short answer is no. First of all, I think, uh, I mean, the Fox population is, is, uh, is uh, at all time high, or actually it might be a little bit decreasing, but still it's very large. But still it's very difficult to see uh, a direct uh, connection between Fox numbers and, uh, and a leech depretation or... Uh, What's the about cost? No, I'm not talking about cost, I'm just talking about depretation or, in fact, uh, the... Uh, the impact of foxes on natural populations. There is actually, there is no hard data on it. Foxes can locally be a problem like in IT colonies and they definitely control the distribution of breeding uh, turns and gulls and so forth and so on. But still it's very hard to uh, just to implement uh, a plan that involves uh, increased fox hunting just because the numbers are so high. So that's, that's my general uh, recommendation, Christine. Listen to the man. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, that's really interesting. And we actually work quite hard with what we call traditional knowledge because we have the Sami herding uh, society that actually base most of their management on traditional knowledge. But we also have the hunters or the forest owners that knows a lot. So we actually tested the traditional and local knowledge. So my part, the first, answer on the question is on, on moose. We tested if hunters, snowmobile, uh, now the thing you put, take away the snow with from the roads, uh, snow plowers. The hunters, the snow plowers and the forest owner actually could tell us the, the density of moose before we actually did the, the monitoring and the change, or at least the change, from previous five-year period where we had the monitoring. And the people that were actually best on this was the snow blowers, <laughs> because they are out a lot and see a lot of moose. And we did it on willow ptarmigans, asking the police, the custom, the Sami people and hunters. And they were quite good in, in tracing the population change and breeding success of large areas. So it's really important and it's a good and valuable complement in the management. Yes, you, as you told us, Maria, we, we uh, think it's not a competition between the different, uh, different knowledge uh, and they are complementary uh, to each other, the traditional and local knowledge. It's complementary for the science. Knowledge, and we have this example with, when we're working in this Cleo project, we have a circumpolar local observer network that it's really important with local observations, and we also have it in uh, this example of uh, when we uh, take uh, we have um, this uh, production model for semi-domestic reindeer. And uh, one part of this uh, model is uh, traditional knowledge from the Sami people. And uh, then we have the mm, uh, scientific uh, knowledge and uh, we separate them. But uh, if they, uh, if they um, uh, added uh, their knowledge in this model, um, I mean the weather or uh, some losses uh, of the reindeer because of the weather or something, or diseases or uh, whatever, uh, then we can actually evaluate the both uh, uh, knowledge types, if you know what, what I mean. Thank you. My name is Erfus I study puffins mainly. But my question is for uh, Christine. Uh, uh, Christine showed data uh, in uh, his talk about sustainability of harvesting Icelandic uh, species. The 31 species are allowed to be harvested, and roughly half of them are, are um, um, harvested in an uh, unsustainable fashion, meaning too many, given the uh, capability of the populations involved. Uh, why haven't your institution proposed 
any um, management plans for any of these pieces in response to uh, these results. And uh, this has been going on now for, for some years. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Arne from the Hunting Association. Um, it seems we have a lot of things to do. <laughs> and um, the good thing is that there is a consensus about, about the approach, the methodology, the one uh, Maria, and sorry, her colleague, <laughs> uh, talked about earlier, the strategy and, and how to implement it. So there has been a lot of discussions in, in Iceland for the, the, in the last decade. In, in general, using this kind of approach, and there is a consensus about how to approach this. But the important thing is to put things into action. And I have a question for uh, Christine Linda, and uh, Jong Ger, you maybe represent the ministry. Um, are there any, being so motivated by the, the, the sessions we already have had here, are there any immediate next steps you, you are have starting thinking about, already decided, or are you waiting for some mot further motiva motivation from, uh, from the hunting association or any other bodies? Are there any other questions? Yes. This is just a short one for, to Christine, and thank you for a very short and blunt answer. Uh, okay, if the fax is probably, well, they're very high, and uh, you don't think there's no reason to increase hunting, is there any species in Iceland that you think we should increase hunting on? Just, if there is any species, please tell me. I think we can take the answers now and then we leave and, and, and you can maybe take the question so very short. a bit later. And I would also like to signal that, uh, you know, after this round of answering, I would just open for questions for once and then we close because the time is flying. So if you have a burning question, please indicate to Bjarni that you want to come back with. Uh, yes, regarding the first question here uh, about why we haven't done any management plan for these species that are, uh, the stocks are going down. Well, we haven't done what you could say a very formal management plan, of, but of course we are aware of this. And we have uh, been using maybe other more, not as direct tools, uh, towards uh, for example, uh, getting knowledge, uh, getting uh, information to, to hunters, uh, talking to municipalities, sometimes these hunting permits are connected to that. Uh, but this is something that we are being more and more aware of, and that why, is why we are having the, this conference here now, because we want to do it in a more direct and open manner, and making sure that we make management plans and that it also is a transparent plan. Uh, and that is maybe what we've been also uh, lacking uh, today, to be more transparent of what we are doing. Uh, but sort of the short answer is we haven't been, done that, been doing that in a very concrete way, but we have been doing it in, in a more uh, information uh, and sharing uh, with hunters. But uh, we are planning uh, for a more direct form in the future. And the next was regarding the next question. What was that? The next steps. Well, well, this is, as I said, this is the first step. Uh, no, we don't need any more encouragement. We have decided that we want to do this. Uh, and of course, uh, we will uh, be in contact with you uh, very shortly. But we need to, uh, we want it here to be at the starting phase, learn from our friends from Sweden, sort of like what kind of plan do we want to put uh, forward. We need to have a, a more in-depth discussion uh, with the ministry. Uh, how do they look at these kind of management plans? What should be included? What should not be included? Should it be a more broad management plan that goes 
and not just what uh, the agency is doing, but what other agencies are also doing? Uh, or should it be more uh, central to our work? So, uh, well, we have already put it in, in our plans for next year to keep on with this work. So, yeah, you don't need to, you, need to, you don't need any extra drivers for us. We are going to do this. Thank you. Well, there are some uh, species that you could that could be hunted in a more intensive way than it's done today. Um, just an example, as the, the pink foot. I mean, it's it's highly possible that or, that it's uh, causing some damage in the highlands, but we do not have the hard data on it. But we still have. Uh, it would be easy to measure it because we have these spots where vegetation has been measured for decades in the highlands. It should be easy to assess it. So that's a good candidate for it. But otherwise, I, I don't particularly. I would encourage hunting of any specific species. There are some species that are totally protected. You would have to change the law. It could, you could easily harvest some of them in some manner, for instance, eider ducks. But that, of course, is a, a social uh, contract that you would break, so that's, a, that's another issue. But it, it, there is nothing against of harvesting even songbirds. We don't harvest them, but the others do. So, so there are many candidates. Just I give you the list in secret. <laughs> Yeah, there was a, uh, I, I, I took up the role here, the humble role of, of, of chairing the session, but I, I got a question if I understood you Arne, correctly, you know. Yes, yeah, uh, you, you know, I think, I mean, as I said in the opening statement on the behalf of the ministry, the ministry welcomes extremely this, this initiative here today where our agency sort of put those things, the wildlife manage, management topics on the agenda. And I think that's a very welcome from us. Uh, and a topic that surely is a big, big issue for the ministry to, to, to deal with and at once. Uh, and uh, I think it's very important that we learn from others when it comes to more strategic thinking about vital man management in a bit more holistic way. We have been uh, we have been moving slowly in in different venues, and I'm 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 a little bit there when it comes to the legislation to sort of follow up it what Christian Hoiko said here earlier on that the legislation in essence is is, uh, is 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 pretty good even though it's since 30 almost 30 years back. Uh, but the big 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 weird odd thing is that it doesn't include a group of species. That's the key lack that I see when it comes to the legislation. There can be some smaller amendments, of course, but that's sort of the big thing. And that's a very highly politically sensitive issue that has to do with the, the mandate over those species in a different ministry from ours. Uh, we are very happy with the improvements that we did in collaboration with the hunters, with our agencies, on reforming the, I don't know, the English word for Vedicourt. The, 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 the scheme when it comes to allocating money and the committee that was established, the committee, the, 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 the committee for sustainable hunting. I think that was a good improvement, moving things forward in the right direction. Uh, when it comes to the individual species that's so, and, and, and more protection on it, uh, I can just mention the protection of TESTA this year that I think was a good step. And we need to take very seriously the advice we are getting from our agencies if, if more steps need to be taken into that direction. Uh, I think we did also a good thing with the ptarmigan hunting, trying to be more long horizon thinking. And I take that a little bit also from the presentations here today, that hunting, the hunting exercise needs a long-term thinking. And now we have three years rotation when it comes to the, the number of, of available days. Perhaps we should move that into five years or ten years or something like that. Uh, and uh, I would also like to mention that we have been very interested to follow the AIVA goose management process and the ministry has participated in international meetings. So we really want to engage into that. So that, that was maybe a bit, 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 bit lo lo long answer in a way that the topic is very important. We, uh, we, we are not extremely worried about this 
legislation, except what, what, what lacks into it, but see a lot of need for you know, advancing the policies. And we welcome also the proposal from the Environmental Agency on, 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 on seeing, you know, uh, as I understood, Christian Linda, a start of more holistic strategy for wildlife management in Iceland. Thanks. There was another. Everything is answered. Okay, then, then we then we take the, take the last round of questions. So, uh, I see three hands. Got me. Yes, my name is Esther. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, just a brief answer to uh, Einar, the hunter, uh, uh, regarding the fox, and uh, maybe some comments. <laughs> um, as I heard it, it was actually almost asking for permission to, from Christine Linta uh, to hunt more foxes, if she would uh, uh, suggest that because of the fox population has been growing. I actually, if you look into hunting statistics that are available on the website of, of the Environmental Agency, you can see that uh, the fox hunting numbers or the harvest numbers have been increasing heavily. So they are actually, there are more hunting there are more foxes hunted as the population grew. So there is no limit. I, I haven't seen any um, management plan from this agency or from the local authorities actually that practice the hunting that they are setting any limits on numbers. So there is actually a freedom sort of to kill as many foxes as, as people feel like, as I, I understand it. Um, so that, that's pretty much... Um, uh, answering that question, which, which actually, um, yeah, that so, that so question is, is answered then. Sorry, the time is flying, so I would yeah, like to ask for I just wanted to, not... yeah, I just wanted to answer that because uh, it was, yeah. And, and another comment was that um, if, if uh, just according to that that little question about if we can ask, uh, kill more foxes since the population was growing, uh, since the Foxes were protected by the wildlife law in 1995. In the next, next 10 years, 100,000 foxes were killed. So I think uh, that is not solving. The population started to increase, and it has been increasing since. So. Thank you. I didn't understand that this was a, this was a question, or more like a comment. So please take the, that discussion. There are two hands that have been raised about questions to the podium. Because we, we, have, we, are, we, are, we have a panel here that we are discussing with, so you can take your bilateral talks afterwards, please. Yeah, please. Uh, one more question to Christine. It's about the adoptive harvest management and the, uh, this uh, new methodology. Do you have any plans to take it up here in Iceland? Because I believe that we hunters are uh, very keen to see different approaches here. Because like you have heard here today that our scientists are very eager to have the hard facts. Sometimes we just do not have the time or the money to have the hard facts. Like you go into a sauna, the thermometer is broken. You know it's hot. You're sweating. <laughs> but still you don't have the hard data. So. I'm saying we, we need to, uh, because of uh, the size of our country and the population, we don't have the money to uh, do everything we like to do. So uh, I think we need to uh, search for a new approach. There was another hand, is that? No, it was the same. It was the same, yeah, okay, yeah, excellent. Yeah, sorry. Yes, Christian, I just wanted to ask you about this uh, methodology you introduced with uh, sustainable hunting and or hunting indexes that you had there. How widely is it used as a, as a management tool, for example, in Europe? And uh, Because some of it uh, looked a bit strange, like the Brennish Kilomot, which, which was very high. We were hunting about 5,000 birds, and uh, according to, for example, data loggers, they seem to be mainly birds from, from east. The Icelandic birds are drifting away, so you're not probably taking into account hunting elsewhere, are you, or in, in these indexes? Or, if, if not, they're seriously flawed. Okay, th thanks for that. That, that will be the last. Now, now we have used up all the time, so this will be the last question. So please, the panel has now the role to answer. Uh, just 
short regarding uh, what Astrid was saying about uh, the foxes. Uh, when we did the first plan, we realized that we did not have very good data to make a, a suggestion of how much hunting pressure should be. So we said we would recommend the same hunting pressure, basically saying we have money to give to the uh, municipalities uh, and we want to see approximately similar or the same hunting pressure. And then we wanted to evaluate it according to how much damage, uh, how big is the population and so forth. And unfortunately, we do not have that. So it is right that there is no higher limit of uh, pressure, but the state, however, has not uh, decided to put more money to give to the municipalities to hold down the, uh, the population of the fox. So the, 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 the money there is, of, of course, a little bit of a, of a driver there. Uh, regarding uh, adoptive management plan, well, we are discussing this here. We are trying to learn. Uh, we know what we've done in the past. Uh, we know what, uh, that we want to uh, change some things. We need to learn and be very concrete what we are doing well and what we want to do better. And this is just a process as, as I see it. Uh, so we will d discuss this further and we will discuss it with you and, and, and other stakeholders with new tools to use. Uh, regarding the PBMR method, it's like a very crude method, as I said, and it is basically used as an analytical tool just to compare data and uh, the, you, the, some of the species that, that are, were listed, of course, the population are not closed. We, are, we get birds from the north and our birds leave to Greenland, so forth and so on, but still it is kind of a, it's a crude comparison tool, so that's what it's used for. How, how widely it is used, I'm not sure. I might be able to comment on that. But in regards to uh, what um, um, uh, Elvar said about the, our um, <laughs> closed mind scientists, well, I probably should use psychedelic drugs just to open my mind. I, I hear that uh, using a lot of whiskey has been doing a lot of good things in the adaptive management plan, so I'm open for everything. <laughs> Uh, okay, then I think we, we have come to the stage to close this uh, conference. I would like to use the opportunity to th bring extreme great thanks to all the speakers and the panelists and of course to you folks that spent the, the afternoon here discussing those extremely important topics. I understand that we are sort of beginning with something new here, if I understood Christine Linda and Christine Hoeker correctly, uh, in our approach here in Iceland, and we are very fortunate to have the opportunity to seek advice from our good uh, Nordic colleagues and from the international venue like the IVA Convention. So I would like to ask you to give them a big hand and then call... <laughs> Thank you.